Yes. Okay. Um, so um, we are going to uh, discuss about rational prescription of antibiotics. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through this only via 10 cases, right? 10 cases. I'm going to use an app called Mentimeter. Um, I hope you all may have heard, but it's not a big issue. So we'll start with the case one now. Right, case one is that a 65 year old patient who is receiving inward care for chronic is on IV cefiroxime and IV metronidazole. The intern medical officer, that is going to be you, who is, going, uh, who is doing the morning rounds, writes on the BHT stating that continue the same management. Okay, hope the case is clear to you all. Right. Okay, it's, it, it's going to be a very common case for you all, uh, the, whoever who, who is going to do as uh, intern medical officer in the surgical wards, right? So now the question is, is the IMO doing the right thing? I don't know who is. Um, is the IMO doing the right thing? Now, what you have to do is, um, in your smartphones, uh, type menti.com. Can you see? menti.com. And it will ask a code number. So then type this code number displaying on the, on the top. Right? Then you, sh you will be able to answer this question. No one can trace back to your identity. No one can. Yes, don't, no need to worry. So you can answer. So only we can see your answers. Everyone can see, but no one can identify who you are. Right? So you can answer confidently. Uh, is the IMO doing the right thing? Prove that you all are from 21st century and you can get these things very easy than our generation, right? Okay, so yeah, they're very good. You have proved. So I am doing the right thing, yes or no? So we have participants, 132 participants, at least 60% uh, should answer. I'll uh, give, uh, give one minute time for you all to react. Twenty people have reacted. Not enough. Twenty-one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because all ten cases we are going to do with uh, this mode, so you should get used to that. You can uh, you can hang around in Mentimeter, right? Mm -hmm. Our stipulated time one minute is over. So then, uh, okay. Right, so majority has chosen the right answer. What the IMO is doing at this point is not correct. Right, why? Let's see why. So now think, write the aspect. So you have, you have got the correct answer, what the IMO is doing. That means just writing, continue the same on the BHT, on a patient who is on any antibiotics. It's not right so that you have identified, very good. So write the aspects the IMOs should check during the ward rounds regarding antibiotic therapy. So in, that, in this case, that IMO, what are the aspects the IMO should have checked before she writes, uh, continue the same. She or he writes, continue the same, right? Now you have to type. You can use the code, right? Again, the same, but here you have to type. But still no one can trace you back. So, but you have to type. Write the aspects. What are the aspects? Briefly, you type, what are the aspects? The IMO should check uh, during the routine ward rounds regarding antibiotic therapy. Any patients on antibiotics, what are the things the IMO should check?
yeah, focusing the answer would be fever chart, full blood count and all. Okay, yes, but more than the specifically regarding antibiotics, frequency, duration, very good. Yeah, compliance because the patient is in the inward patient and you are giving IV, so no point. It should be 100% compliant. So frequency correct. Whether the antibiotic sensitive or is it tracing the culture reports? Yes, tracing the culture reports, whether it is empiric treatment, then tracing the culture report, very important. Duration of the therapy, important. One more important thing I'm searching for. Any other, any challenges to medication, any allergies? Because the patient is on antibiotics. So then allergies are a bit of question. If you, before initiating, yes, but this is the patient is on antibiotics. Improvement with antibiotics, yes, improvement. Clinical improvement should be checked, yes. And response to the antibiotics, yes, clinical improvement. Uh, clinical status, yes. Total duration. One more important thing about antibiotics. Let's see, frequency correct, duration correct, clinical important correct, um, checking the culture reports correct. One more, one more thing. Let's see how many of you all are getting that one more important thing about antibiotics. Patient is on antibiotic therapy during the ward rounds. What is the other most important thing the intern medical officer should check about that antimicrobial therapy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think you can. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are 36 responses, but I am seeing only the limited option. I don't know why. So, so the, about the important aspects is the dose, right? You should not forget the dose. Every time when you go through the, the during the ward rounds, if the patient is on antibiotics, just check again whether the dose is correct, whether the duration, whether the frequency is correct, whether the indication is correct. That means you need to trace back the, the culture results and see whether we are do, doing the right thing. Yeah, and then the clinical, clinical improvement, whether the patient is improving, can be switched. So, so these are the important aspects you need to uh, you need to look before you write on the BHD. Simply continue the same or CTS, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, think you don't need to memorize anything that you have come come beyond that exam point of view study. This is for your life. So then, put in your brain in certain aspects uh, that that you can never forget. Right? Okay, we'll go move along. Right? Okay. So that is about the case one. Okay, now it's moving around case two. Here, a 60-year-old lady with chronic foot wound brings the following report to the diabetic foot clinic. You're sitting in the clinic doctor. You will be doing soon. So he, she is bringing uh, this report. It's a wound swab sample. The culture reveals an acinetobacter species. You will come across this, unfortunately, frequently. Acinetobacter species. And the ABST, you see Keftazidine resistant, gentamicin, cefipi, meropenem, cipro, imipenem, amicacin, yeah, just intermediate, and colistine. You can vaguely remember in your fourth year, colistine, somebody has told that is sensitive. Kefapirazone, salvectum, you may not remember at all, sensitive. Cotrimoxazole resistant. So this is a report you are having, right? Okay. So now, and then the clinical record saying her CRP and ESR normal. Okay. Maybe you must be happy about it. And wound inspection, you, you, you see the wound and it reveals a very dry, shallow wound with no tenderness, chronic wound, typical chronic wound. So now the question is, does she require antibiotic therapy, systemic antibiotic therapy? Does she require systemic antibiotic therapy? Okay. Have you read the case clearly? Is that clear? I assume it is. And I'm going to the question uh, and the voting can uh, play where you can vote. Does she require antibiotic therapy? So again, a recall, 60-year-old diabetic foot clinic, um, and then sample wound swab sample revealed a multi-drug resistant acinetobacter, inflammatory markers normal, wound inspection satisfactory. So now the question is, does she require antibiotic therapy? Yes. Okay, have a look. 
and what, yes or no? Does she require antibiotic? I think you all are mastering in Mentimeter, very quick responses coming out. That's good. Gen, uh, you all are, I, think, I don't know whether you all belong to Generation Z or not. So those people are, those who are born after 2000 are called Gen Z and they are very brilliant, it seems. Right. I, I, I will give another 30 seconds for you to react. Um, whether she is said the wound swap sample, multidrug resistant acinetobacter, clinical examination, and uh, uh, hemat he hematological uh, measurements are normal. So now the question is whether she needs antibacterial therapy or not. So majority is uh, uh, going towards uh, no, but there are people still believe that uh, she needs uh, antibacterial therapy. We'll wait for another 15 seconds for more people to react. Wound swap sample, multidrug resistant acinetobacter, clinical and hematological parameters are normal. Whether she needs antimicrobial therapy or not, that is the question. Still the response rate is around 25%. Okay, anyway, we accept. So now we'll move on uh, and see uh, what does it mean. So another important principle in antimicrobial therapy or antibiotic therapy uh, um, in, in surgical wards, that is we need to differentiate colonization versus infection. So any wounds will have organisms on the wound surface. You cannot prevent it, yes, because your skin is not there, there is a gap. So then the bacteria will colonize. So that is called colonization. So systemic antibiotics will not be effective. So this is colonization. So you cannot eradicate by using systemic antibiotics because yeah, you should remember a certain pathophysiological aspects of diabetic wounds where the diabetic wounds is mainly due to the uh, macrovascular pathies of due to diabetes. So then the blood supply to the wound area is not up to the mark. It's not that as you expect. So then whatever the anti systemic antibiotics you give, whether IV or oral, the availability, bioavailability of that agent in the site of action would be a question. Okay. So then you will be, you will not achieve the target that you want to achieve. You can't do that. So it will not be effective. So that is not an effective method to clear colonization. That is number one. Number two, if there is evidence of local and or, or systemic inflammation, then that is called infection. So organism just sitting and wait, we don't bother. Organism is causing some trouble while sitting and waiting, then we bother. So that uh, how do we know the organism is causing trouble? By local and systemic features of inflammation. Right? So, so then systemic antibiotics may have a role, may have a role, right? Okay, may have a role. So then how do you determine that? So just a simple wound swab, very easy to collect. You can simply order wound swab. Any, any nursing staff would be happy to collect. Even a minor staff can collect. That is just the swabbing the wound. Right? But it will not represent a true infection. So what we need as microbiologists, we just look that swab as a uh, thing. But if you send pus or tissue sample, we will look at a oh, precious sample. We should preserve it like this. So pus or tissue samples are better, always better than wound swabs for culture. Right? Remember that. So wound inspection and inflammatory markers are very necessary for you to decide on antibiotic therapy or not. Just because seeing a multidrug resistant organism on wound swab doesn't require treatment. Okay, I hope uh, I have made the point and it is clear to you all. Shall I wait for a few seconds for you to react on the chat box saying yes or no? At least uh, uh, 20 people reacting would be enough. Just mention on the chat box, yes or no, whether I have clarified or the point is clear. Yes or no, that's all on the chat box. Yep, one, one person has reacted, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Target achieved. So, yeah. So then this is an important aspect you need to remember. Right. Okay. Now go. So, case three. Okay. 52 year old with poorly controlled diabetes presents with features of urosepsis. Okay. Very common condition you will come across when you work in a medical ward during your intermedical period. The medical registrar, if you are lucky enough, uh, maybe there are there are plus and minuses of having registrars around you. But uh, okay, uh, we'll consider it as plus. So if you work in a uh, in a teaching hospital or a bigger hospital, there you will be having registrars around you. So they will guide you. So the medical registrar who is on call starts IV meropenem on this patient, fifty-two year old. Poorly controlled diabetes presents with features of urosepsis. Registrar is starting IV meropenem. After taking blood and urine for culture, right? So the intern medical officer, maybe a young, enthusiastic, new doctor asking, why are you meropenem, right? Can't we start a third generation teflospore, right? Okay, very good question. Start asking. So the medical registrar now replies, no, 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 this is the ESBL rate of coliforms isolated last year at our hospital is around 35%. And then he stops, okay? And he, he assumes that you will understand the remaining part of his sentence. Now, my question is, do you agree with this empiric antibiotic therapy? The registrar starts. That means 52-year-old, poorly controlled diabetes, presence with urosepsis, starting on IV meropenem, after taking blood and urine culture, very good. Um, so you do you agree with this empiric antibiotic therapy? Okay. Right, I hope the case is clear. So then you can vote. 52 year old, poorly controlled diabetes, urosepsis, meropenem was started as an empiric antibiotic therapy. Do you agree with this empiric antibiotic therapy? We are living in a democratic country where we strongly believe the majority are correct, but not always the truth. I'll wait for another 30 seconds um, for you all to react again. Thirty-three people, not enough. I think I need more people to react for this important question. At least the 50% should react. So it's now 34, I'll wait for another 16 to react. React via mentee, then only we can see the percentage. Some people are putting uh, the reaction on the chat box that's difficult to Well, more people to react. Some people are reacting via the chat box. Okay, I I, I guess that the yes or no uh, via the chat box for this question. So there are yes answers coming up from the chat box. So when we calculate both, so we have achieved that 50 target. So then I will uh, um, uh, try to explain certain things regarding this, right? So we need to remember about this ESBLs, extended spectrum beta lactamases. Maybe your third year farm module or infectious disease module uh, or antibiotics module, you would have, have uh, you would have had MCQs on this. Oh, you may remember, may I, I don't expect, but but you need to remember certain things for your entire life. Right? So our enzymes produced mainly by enterobacteria, so that's organisms which live in our own gut, right? Coliforms, right? The they produce it. 
So they, these enzymes can destroy beta lactams from penicillin to fourth generation cephalosporin, right? Fourth generation. I'm not going to ask what are fourth generation cephalosporins. So, so first, second, third, and fourth generation cephalosporins, so that this can destroy the array of antibiotics, beta lactams, which are the mainstay of our treating patients um, presenting with sepsis. Right? So it necessitates this production of beta lactamases, extended spectrum beta lactamases, necess necessitate carbapenems for CV infections due to ESBL producers. So that register is correct. Right? So he has checked the ESBL rate of the hospital. That's very important, but not always available. Right? So that's why we have, I think Dr. Kishani has shown you all the national antibiotic guidelines, right? Antimicrobial guidelines. So that guidelines is uh, formulated based on these facts. Right? So you can always refer uh, to start empiric treatment in your patients, right? The national guidelines, okay, right. So it necessitates carbapenems for severe infections due to ESBL producers. Do not forget that. Okay. Now a little bit of statistics about Sri Lankan statistics, uh, the antimicrobial resistance in, uh, uh, in polyforms. ESBL rate in Sri Lanka is around 25 to 40%, 25 to 40%. That means if you... One in fourth polyforms, two half of the holy nearly, can have ESBL production. So whenever you suspect, whenever you suspect uh, gram-negative sepsis like urosepsis or intra-abdominal sepsis, whenever you suspect gram-negative, then you should not forget the ESBL production rate in Sri Lanka. Right? And resistant to third generation cephalosporin, see the see the rates, fifty to sixty percent, more than fifty percent of the polyforms are resistant to third generation cephalosporin. So point plus to start as an empiric therapy because you have one is to one ratio of failures, right? You can't have it. So the carbapenem resistant rate is alarming. It's very alarming, 10 to 15%, but still well below than your uh, cephalosporin resistant rate. So, so, so for us at the moment, carbapenem is the drug of choice as an empiric therapy for any gram negative sepsis. I hope I have made the point very clear to you all. Right. Antibiotics are life-saving and we need to use appropriately to preserve their efficacy. So this case, urosepsis, poly control diabetes, with the ESBL rate in the country around 25 to 40%, with the uh, third generation cephalosporin rate in the country around 50 to 60%, carbapenem are the drug of choice. Okay. Hope it's clear to you all. Right. So now the case three again. It's going on the case three, okay? So that urosepsis patient, now empiric antibiotics started well and good, but the registrar has done a good job that taken samples, blood and urine sample for culture. So then a blood culture now reveals third day, um, uh, because the turnaround time for blood culture, it's 48 to 72 hours, right? Because you need to isolate the organism, you need to do the ABST, and then only you can get it. So on the third day of admission, uh, the blood culture reveals it is Escherichia coli. You expected it because it's urosepsis. And uh, so then the, and the sensitivity pattern reveals ampicillin resistant expected, CIPCO resistant, of course, it not uncommon. Cephotaxime sensitive, cotrim sensitive, coamoxiclar sensitive, gentamicin sensitive, ceftriaxone sensitive. Good organism, right? Okay, now we come to the patient. Currently, the patient on IV meropenem, day three, started by, by the registrar as a empiric therapy, well and good. Clinically responding very well, expected. Uh, and his CRP, the patient CRP has come down to 200, uh, from 220 to 120, still a bit high, but it's showing a response. It's showing a good response. Now, day three of meropenem. Okay, right. So now the question, now you are doing the ward rounds in the morning. You are seeing the report is there. Patient is on meropenem. Inflammatory markers are like that, right? Clinical response is like that, okay. So what is the next step in the antibiotic management of this patient? That is the question. Okay, shall we have a look? Shall we have, go for a vote? And you have you internalized the question? Eurosepsis, empiric therapy on IV meropenem, day three, responding okay. Responding, clinical response is good. Culture reveal as such, right? Culture reveals as such. In the culture report, meropenem sensitivity is not mentioned. You need to think about that as well. So there are other options available. So now what is the next step in the antibiotic management of this patient? Okay. 
you can start voting. Whether you need to continue meropenem or you need to switch to ceftriaxone or you need to add the oral cortrimoxazole with meropenem or you need to add the gentamicin to meropenem or you need to switch to oral pharmacyclic. What is the best uh, as the next management step? So at least 60 people should react to this question. I will wait for a complete one minute for this. Try to use the uh, uh, Menti app to uh, express your views uh, regarding this question because then only we can have the count. Um, you, you are free to use the chat, there's no, no problem at all, but um, to have a so around. Uh, 38 people have reacted, so I would wait for another 12 more seconds. You need to react. Then only we know we are with a live audience. <laughs> so 12 people, 12 more people to react on the uh, exam. Eurosepsis on IV uh, meropenem as an empiric antibiotic uh, therapy. Blood culture revealed uh, an organism which is susceptible to other agents. Meropenem susceptibility was not there on the report. So uh, patient is clinically improving. Uh, what is the next step in the management? That's the question. So some people have said continue meropenem. Some have said, uh, uh, actually majority has said the switch to ceftriaxone. And some have said to add another, uh, uh, another agent with ongoing meropenem. So what uh, So some people reacted by the chat box uh, uh, revealed the continue meropena. So 46 people reacted. Some people by the chat box. So another 10, at least 10 more to react on in this. Okay, right, considering the time I, I, okay. So the majority has picked up the correct answer, right? So this is empiric versus targeted therapy. And uh, when you start an empiric therapy, this is a must to trace the cultures because why we are sending cultures before starting empiric therapy? is to target our therapy appropriately. So starting meropenem is very good. Any gram-negative sepsis, we need to start meropenem because of the statistics that we have, right? That's well and good. But when we have a culture result to guide us, then we should, we should be properly guided, right? Okay. So now no point of continuing meropenem. Now we have to go back uh, and step down or de-escalating or rationalize or targeting. All the words are the same, targeting, the antimicrobial therapy that we are giving to the patient. This is the best next step uh, in the management of this patient. Okay. So switching to septrix, and that is the good option. Continuing meropenem is raw, not acceptable. Septrixone, correct. Adding oral cortrimoxone, no point. You don't need to do that. Se second agent to add, there is no indication, of that, right? Aminoglycosides, no need. Oral, we cannot switch to oral immediately because still the, the inflammatory markers are high, the infection is pyelonephritis and bacteremia. So then we need to have an IV therapy 
for a quite a period of time before we switch to oral. So the best option here is switching to septraxel. Now a little bit around that, we'll have a look. So before that, I have one answer for this question. What is the most significant impact on continuing meropenem on this patient? Like, or certain people you have, how many percentage? Uh, 19 out of uh, 48 reacted. That means uh, uh, just below 50%, but quite a good amount have uh, mentioned that continuing meropenem. So now the question is, what is the most significant impact on uh, uh, impact on this patient by continuing meropenem? So by continuing meropenem, what is the impact that we are causing on the patient? So write your answer. You can type. What is the only one word? Not not too much. Just just one word. Oh, right. small. Type uh, using the code. Type via this. Direct impact. What is the most significant impact on the patient? Think about the patient. Are we doing anything to the patient? Antibiotic resistance is, uh, 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 yeah, that is, I, I'm not saying no, but more than that, what is to the patient? Renal toxicity, meropenem is not a renal toxic drug. There are more renal toxic drugs than meropenem. So more than that, more than that giving a broad spectrum drug, what can it do to the patient? How can we impact? How can, do we, will we damage anything on the patient? I agree with resistance. I agree with cost, um, but more than that, more than that. Yeah, very good, very good. Some have found out, kill, the, kill other good bacteria. Yes, that is very important. We should not forget that. We should not forget the, the patient's own flora, damage to the patient's own flora. What is the magic term for that? Collateral damage, collateral damage. Right? We, we, have, we have no rights to do that, collateral damage. Recently, we had a session in our Vatican Medical Association and a judge came and delivered uh, 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 in-depth talk about medical negligence. And he has listed out certain things which are uh, considered as medical negligence. Um, and one of, uh, and, and, and uh, I, I wonder, very soon they will put it as damaging the normal flora is also a medical negligence because that is coming uh, in other countries as medical negligence. Right? So we cannot do that. So we should be ration, we should be rational uh, in prescribing antimicrobials. Okay, we'll see a little bit about it. I, I would love to uh, focus on this slide and recall your year one. Year one means not great, but year one in the medical school, right? Year one in the medical school. And then see, see the interesting finding of this study. We all know that, but we don't never appreciate. So see, see, see the, see the uh, number count. So we have, around 30 trillion cells for our own right, ours. So majority is our red cells, 25 trillion red cells and 5 trillion other cells together. So we have 30 trillion for our own cells, our own genes, our own DNA, right? 30 cells, 30 trillion cells. See this, see this. The same time we have 38 trillion cells living with us, living with us, right? 38 trillion cells living with us, our own flora, our own flora. We cannot ignore them. We cannot ignore them. So 30 trillion our own cells and 38 trillion own flora. They are our friends. They are living with us. We need to protect them. That's our responsibility. That's our ecosystem. We cannot just ignore them, right? So 30 trillion our own cells into 38 trillion bacteria. Remember that. We cannot forget this. A magic number, right? Okay. So now see this. Now revisit the term selective toxicity. You can remember in your third year when the pharmacology people starts their session on antibacterials, they must have told this magical term selective toxicity because bacteria is different, our cells are different. So antibacterial agents will affect the bacteria, not us. There may be side effects, yes, of course, but not very common. But the selective toxicity is the feature 
uh, important feature of antibacterial agents, your antimicrobial agents, right? However, now see, is it true? Is it possible? Because it is true for the 30 trillion cells of our own, our own cells. Yes, we have a different set of metabolism. So penicillin will not act on our cells, right? Okay, we don't have cell wall to inhibit. That's fine. But, but it is not true for the 38 trillion cells which live with us or live in us. So that is called collateral damage, right? So rational prescription of antibiotics or antibacterial, so antimicrobials, is very essential to protect our own flora, right? So it, we, 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 our main principle of medicine is do no harm and damaging the collateral, damaging the flora which live, us, live in us is not acceptable anymore uh, in the legally as well. Okay. So um, be, be vigilant about this important fact. Okay, good. Now case three, right. Now think this blood culture, uh, it doesn't, uh, the blood culture report not include the sensitivity of merapen. Yeah. So why? So this is called selective reporting. That's, that's a part of the anti antibiotic stewardship or antimicrobial stewardship that the, the laboratory plays, plays a role in it. So why we don't do it? Because we have first line agents, which are sensitive. So the second line agents are not reported. So that is to stimulate you, target your therapy, target your therapy, target your therapy. Don't just continue because just because you started it. You started well and good, but now target. This is the time to target. That is called reviewing of antibiotics. To promote it, we do selective reporting. Okay, That's a global practice and it's part of antibiotics to achieve. Yeah. I hope you all understood that. Right, now case four. Are we with the time? Is it a 50-year-old uh, patient with chronic kidney disease presents with features of sepsis. Dialysis line-related bloodstream infection is suspected. The nephrology team starts IV vancomycin and IV amethacin after taking uh, blood samples through the line and via peripheral puncture. Next day, the microbiology team informs that his blood culture are growing gram-positive cocci in clusters. Right. So CKD patient, line sepsis, then uh, suspected line sepsis, started with empiric antibiotic bank and amicacin. Now the blood culture reveals, uh, prim preliminary report reveals gram-positive cocci in clusters. So what change will you do to his empiric antibiotic therapy? Vote it. Whether you will continue bank and stop amicacin, or you will stop both and start on IV fluke clocks, or you stop both and start on IV meropenem, or you stop amicacin and add the IV ceftriaxone to vancomycin, or you stop amicacin and continue vancomycin. What you will do? Oh, yeah, that uh, first and fifth, uh, one and fifth are the same. So sorry about it. So you can. Uh... So gram positive cocaine clusters. Patient is on amicacin and vancomycin. What we need to do? Gram positive, the preliminary report. Gram positive cocaine clusters. Check how many minutes we have. Okay. So we have a uh, time is of a, uh, yeah, we need to finish. We, we should have finished by this time. I think. So we'll take somebody's mic is on. Okay, so then, uh, right, Men, the majority has identified the correct answer. That is, we need to continue vancomycin while stopping amicacin because the, the, the vancomycin is for gram positive and amicacin is for gram negative. So 
empirically without knowing that they start yeah. both right me oh, yeah. <laughs> who is the best person in the whole world what are you ege deela dena code ekak e code ekak thamai dana somebody's mic is on pretty please mute so um uh, then uh, then now the lab is saying this is gram positive cocaine clusters in both cultures so then we can that come confidently stop the gram negative cover that is anika right okay. so this is how the the laboratory guides you in rational practicing of antimicrobial therapy okay hope that you got it so now we'll move on to the next case here you are working at a profunit medical ward following an ndt discussion it is decided to start oral linozolid on a patient with vertebral osteomyelitis due to mrsc so then the in charge nursing officer of the ward gives you a form saying that you have to fill it and get the microbiology signature then only the indo pharmacy will issue so think why is this procedure right your answer why is this procedure why we need to do that linazolid and a special form and that uh, the in charge nursing officer says it should be filled and should be signed by the microbiologist to get the drug uh, from the pharmacy what do you think why we have that procedure what does it signify mm -hmm. no answer Mm -hmm. to reduce abuse antibiotics to a chip it's reserved for severe infection cases okay good good some some idea you have right okay because of the time limit I, i'm past yeah, high cost yeah yeah it's high cost but mainly to yeah not mainly to uh limit it's, it's reserved it's, it's a reserved drug we'll see what it is right now check whether you are aware of this aware classification this is a who's classification the sri lanka is going to adopt this very soon so as uh, uh, as internal medical officers you will be uh, getting the circular very soon right and you have to uh, practice it so there are three categories access watch and reserve access category there are 48 drugs listed so that is uh, you have free but there's a low resistance potential free means that you cannot use for you cannot think it is granted but there is a sense of rational use but still it's an access right so the next category 110 drugs listed in it that is watch category we are it's critically important drugs and it's high resistance potential you, sh you should be very watchful in prescribing that and uh, continuing that and there's a category reserved category like this polymyxine linozolid Uh, rifampicin does things so then that you don't have an authority to prescribe on its own on your own so you need to have some limitations so that and there should be an ndt there should be forms to fill that because all these to put up barriers hurdles don't abuse think before prescribing it's an extra burden to you so it, because it it is a reserved drug right so that's what uh, that is to promote rational prescription and to minimize antimicrobial resistance this is a global uh, global thing and we are adapting it to okay right. oh, we are classification remember that k6 four year old presents with features of right knee joint septic arthritis blood and joint <clears throat> pus samples grow mrsc pis on iv meropenem and iv clindamycin which was started empirically right empiric therapy now day 3 of admission so now we know it's a mrsa causing uh, septic arthritis so what change should be done to the empiric antibiotic therapy what septic arthritis due to mrsa on meropenem and clindamycin so what uh, uh, change we need to do stop meropenem and continue clindamycin or continue meropenem and add vancomycin or stop meropenem and add fluplox or continue meropenem and clindamycin or stop meropenem and add vancomycin mrsc septic arthritis meropenem and clindamycin as, as empiric therapy react quickly right we'll stop because of the time yeah majority has identified very correctly mrsa vancomycin the glycopeptides are the drug of choice 
for any invasive MRSA infection. So that is the correct way. We need to stop meropenem and vancomycin should be added to it. Right, good. So see that antimicrobial resistance in staphylococcus in current Sri Lankan practice is around 60% of our staphylococcus aureus are MRSC. Very, very, uh, very worrying thing. Uh, the, yeah, so, and, uh, and MRSC has altered penicillin binding protein that then the, all the beta lactams uh, that we currently have will not be effective against. So it's not third, up to third, it's up to fourth generation also will not be effective. Carbapenems will not be effective. And beta lactam, beta lactam S inhibitor combination will not be effective. So our choices are very limited. And mainly the glycopeptides are the ones uh, which we can use for invasive MRSA infections. Okay. So this is to stimulate that part. Uh, now our case seven. So surgical intensive care unit of a teaching hospital notices increasing incidence of ICU acquired infections due to multidrug resistant acinetobacter species. You will come across very soon, which is sensitive only to cholestine and amikacin. So the ICU team is planning to develop a protocol to curtail this infection. So just choose which of the following should be included in the protocol. Okay, you can you can uh, uh, vote. Yeah. You can vote uh, whether you strongly disagree or strongly agree or in between for each method. Um, monitoring the consumption of alcohol, hand rub in the ICU, whether you agree with that. Recording the duration of invasive uh, uh, devices on the front page of the um, uh, observation, whether you agree with that. Uh, recording the duration of antibiotics daily on the drug chart, whether you agree with that. Providing prophylactic amicacy nebulization to patients on ventilator, whether you agree with that. Starting IV cholestine on patients who receive the ICU care for more than 48 hours, whether you agree. And uh, continuing, uh, sorry, conducting central line associated bloodstream infection surveillance, whether you agree. And uh, practicing aseptic touch, aseptic non-touch technique while inserting and maintaining urinary catheters, where, whether you agree. So this is to curtail the MDR. I think majority uh, uh, is on the right track, right, right track. So monitoring alcohol consumption is very essential. It's an indirect uh, evidence of uh, hand hygiene compliance of the staff. So that's a good thing to do. And it's very effective as well. Duration of invasive devices on the ticket is very important. Then only you can review every day whether the device is needed or not. So that is very important to prevent these infections. Duration of antibiotics daily in the drug chart is also very important. So then only you know how long it has been given, how long to be given, like that is good. Providing prophylactic chemicals in, never, it's out because it will not be effective. Starting cholesterol on patients who receive ICU care for more than 40 is no, it, it is very bad. It, it will not be useful at any point, yeah, it's out. And conducting central line surveillance, very good. That is to be done. And uh, practicing aseptic non-touch technique, yes, that is the must. Uh, to minimize, right? That's okay. So are, these are the general principles for you to get an idea how we can uh, con control these infections around us. Uh, two more, three more cases. So we'll quickly, that's the easy case that a child with acute gastroenteritis features, right? Okay. CRP normal, moderately dehydrated, but otherwise clinically the child is stable. So whether the child needs antibiotic or not, quickly vote. Let's see how very good. Majority pointed out correctly. This is a most common viral gastroenteritis. So antibiotics are out. So we don't prescribe antibiotics for this, this condition. Very good. Next question. Vaginal swab of a pregnant mother at term who is admitted with dribbling reveals coliforms, which is resistant to teflosporins. So her first child is five-year-old and uh, that's a, this is her second pregnancy and she never had been in hospital other than the first confinement. So in that context, but the history reveals that uh, the child, first child is a recurrent upper respiratory tract infection sufferer. And then uh, they take medications for that. And for that, they have given several antibiotics such as coamoxiclav, cefiroxime, cefalexin, even cefixime, acetromycin, clarithromycin. They have been used by the GP outside. So now the question is, what is the most likely reason for this mother to have resistant coliforms in her vagina? What is the most right? No, coliforms are not intrinsically resistant to Keplosporins. They are not. They are not. Hospital acquired colonization is unlikely because it is on admission culture. Mother comes uh, with dribbling and that admission vaginal sub reveal this. So hospital acquired is out. 
It indicates presence of chorioretinitis. No, that is also the patient is completely well. Uh, it's probably due to contamination of fecal flora. Yes, it is contamination of fecal flora, but why it is resistant? That is the question. Yes, the yellow color ones are correct. The daughter's gut flora must have developed resistance and it has got transmitted to her. That is very common. For that, we have a picture. Yeah, I'm not going to explain that, but it's, it's very uh, explanatory picture. That's antimicrobial resistance spreads in the community and in between people and from animal to people. Right. We should not forget that. Whenever the antibiotics we are using, our 38 trillion cells living with us are exposed to that antibiotics and they start some difference to survive in that antibiotic exposure. And if the exposure is more and more and more, then they are, they are, their reaction is more and more and more too. So that is what's happening. So this five-year-old child, would the five-year-old child's gut flora would have, it, it must, it, it has got exposed even to cefixine. So to withstand that trauma that started producing ESBLs, obviously, and that flora transmits around uh, the family and friends. Yeah, that is natural. So that's what happened to here as well. So this is a very common problem and you need to think about it, right? Okay, our last one. Third year medical student with dengue fever, evidence of leak, blood counts are like this, platelet like this, uh, hematocritus like this. Does this student require antibiotics? Dengue leak, critical phase. That's very good. Majority are correct. It's dengue, whether it is leak or not leak, we don't need to start antibiotics unless we strongly suspect, unless we have clinical evidence of secondary infection. Very good, right, okay. So these are the major things that I want to discuss with you. I have taken 10 minutes more. No one will excuse me for that. So the take home message is, if you see a patient on antibiotics during your daily ward rounds, check the indication, that is the must. And why, indication means what? Why is this patient on this antibiotic? What are the evidence of infection? Check again, think again, and check the dose and the duration and the frequency. Check the culture reports and review the empiric antibiotic therapy to target it, okay? Remember that. And protecting the patient's normal flora is an important part of our duty as doctors because we are promised to do no harm. Okay, right. Thank you very much. And adopt aware classification and have a nice internship period. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. And we will share a feedback session, a feedback form uh, with you all at the end. Uh, and please fill it. Okay. Hope you had a useful session and have a, we'll be having a useful day uh, too. Thank you very much. And, and next is Dr. Madhumani. I hope I, um, she, um, is she around? Yes, my dear, I'm here. Ah, yes. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. You can carry on. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, good morning to you all, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we, I have I had to change the schedule some other reason. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the chance. My so, pleasure. Uh, after a very interesting and uh, uh, and a very interesting and uh, alarming lecture about antimicrobial resistance and all. So we are going to talk about the collection and transport of microbiological specimens, uh, which will actually help uh, irrational use of antibiotics. So in my uh, lecture, I'm going to discuss about the principles of collection of, and transport and a little bit of uh, additional practice to be able to collect proper samples, arrange, the, arrange, arrange for proper transport and interpret common microbiological tests as well. So why this collection of in, uh, samples are so important? Because when you ask you, I mean, if you, you know that if you feed something, you get the result. So such quality of specimen is very important to get the quality report. So if you not, if you don't send the quality quality specimen, you will not get the quality report. In between, of course, there's quality of test as well. So we have a test cycle, which you call pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. 
pre-analytical is yours, post-analytical uh, is in the lab, and post-analytical is again yours with some sort of uh, guidance from our side. So in pre-analytical, so correct sampling, correct labeling, correct transport, correct storage, and uh, adding clinical information is very, uh, very important to get a very good sample. So before collecting a sample, always consider, is there an infection? This is about uh, microbiology samples. So if there's no infection, don't do microbiology tests. So if so, yes, there's something going on, some fever. And so what where is the infection? Patient is having fever. Um, sorry, yeah. Patient is having fever, we have to find the focus of infection. Is it chest? Is it urine? Is it meningitis? It is sepsis? So on. Because with that, only we will start taking samples. What are the appropriate samples depending on the site of infection? I would give a case scenario. A patient, sorry for the spelling, patient comes with fever and dysuria. So what are you going to do? What are the microbiological investigations you are going to do? Because this is too simple, I'm not going to ask you. So this could be urine culture. Yes, blood culture, if he has got fever, yes. And what about sputum culture? Do you need to do a sputum culture or not? What, what's your opinion? Just tell me a few people at least uh, yes or no answer. Any answers? Is it too simple? No, thank you. Yes, we don't have to. I have gone, uh, sorry, I have just moved my slides. Yes, we don't need sputum cultures. But what really happened in a, in a ward, uh, it's kind of like uh, ticking boxes. You take, uh, uh, you urine culture, blood culture, sputum culture, whatever the possible, all the things will be taken, but which is a waste of resources and waste of your time. And uh, sometimes we will never know what to do with the results if it comes. So just imagine you get sputum culture with some organisms. Do you have to treat it? No, because you don't have to. So it will it'll complicate the things only. And the second case, a 62 years old patient with fever, with chills and backache and dysuria, and samples are taken, full blood count, UFR, blood culture, and is that all? I, I'm taking these things from real, real situations. So what is the... Uh, Extremely sorry because uh, my uh, internet connection is not very stable. I had to use my uh, telephone connection, but when I get calls, um, it, it, got, it gets disconnected. Really sorry because hospital connection is even poorer. 
Um, so, um, right, do we have, yes, urine culture and ABSD, thank you. Yes, we have to have urine culture and ABSD. I think you don't see my slides, is it? You are so silent. Yeah, not uh, it, it, we were able to see, now it's disappeared. Yeah, yeah, because after dis getting disconnected, yes, sorry. And now sorry now we that. can see that, yes. Yeah, I will, I will go to the previous slide. Yes, so, it's, so that we have to do the urine culture, but most of the time they forget about it. So the ne next uh, case is um, a patient diagnosed dengue with antigen positive and typical, typical features, uh, day one in ICU. What are the samples you need to do? I think I'm going, sorry, sorry, I'm getting this problem again and again. I don't know how to uh, handle it. Um, so in this situation, samples taken, blood culture, urine culture, it is secretion culture. And so this is a real thing I'm telling about you. The patient who comes to ICU, they, they, they are so practiced to take samples, but we, 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 what, what is lacking is thinking. So you don't have to do uh, blood cultures, urine cultures, or it is secretions unless you suspect anything later on being in the ICU. So secondary bacterial infection or something, but initially you don't have to. So which samples to be taken in this situation? Depend on the presumptive diagnosis. So if it is viral fever, you don't have to take bacterial cultures. If the patient is suspe suspected to be having urosepsis, blood culture and urine culture. And if you suspect skin and soft tissue infection, pass aspirate and swab. If the patient is having fever and generally septic, you have to take a blood culture. If the patient is having pneumonia, to take a sputum culture. And uh, if he's unwell as systemically unwell, take a blood culture. And in pus, in wounds, pus is a better sample than a wound swab. These are common things. We are going to go into specific things soon. And stool is better than a rectal swab. And lung aspirate, I know it is not done frequently, but it is a very good sample. Lung aspirate, pleural aspirates are better than sputum. I know that it is not possible. So we are going for sputum most of the time. And blood cultures is uh, useful in systemic infections, such as urosepsis, skin and soft tissue causing systemic infections, severe pneumonia, and, and any other. If the site cannot be determined, so patient comes with high fever, semi-conscious, uh, you don't know what's going on. These are the most of the common cases who comes to uh, ETU. The patient is almost unconscious. So in that situation, if the patient had fever, of course you had to take septic screen. So septic screen means everything. Blood culture, urine culture, if the, you can get a sputum sample, sputum culture. And if you suspect, maybe, I mean, it's not the first line uh, investigation, but um, even CSF culture. And in uh, neonates, of course, because you don't find, it's very difficult to find a focus. So in, in, in uh, uh, neonates also, sometimes you need to do a septic screen. So in ICU patients who have been in the ICU and having fever, again, we may have to do the septic screening and uh, again, uh, pyrexia of unknown origin. So septic screen means taking cultures from all the possible sites which can cause, because we are in a, in a very bad patient because lungs are bad and patient, patients are catheterized and uh, running fever, high CRP, we don't know uh, what's going on. So, and uh, some samples, of course, depend on the stage of illness and uh, microbiological facilities as well, because there's no point of taking cultures, bacterial, uh, if, say, late, part, latter part of the 
illness in most of the cases and uh, such as uh, um, such as uh, say like uh, if you are taking viral samples in a patient with dengue after five seven days there's no point of doing antigen so uh, but you have to take antibodies so it depends on the stage of illness and the microbiological facilities facilities means so well, say you want to take a anaerobic culture but anaerobic cultures are not available in mo most of the facilities hospitals then of course you have to send it to somewhere else like mri So, when should we take samples? Excuse me, madam. Yes. The slides are not moving, madam. Not at all. Yes, madam. Oh dear. Um. So, uh, we'll check again. Uh, now, can you see the slide? Which side can you see? Is it uh, which start with when? The patient with diagnosed dengue day one in ICU slides. Oh dear. Wait a second. Um, shall I stop sharing and share again? Okay, madam. What a Can you see uh, sh uh, moving? Yes, madam. Now moving. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. So we were at a uh, patient with diagnosed dengue. Thank you for telling me at least after a few, few slides gone. So, uh, so we have talked about it, samples and all. We will go to the slides I have to, been talking about. So when, when sample should, uh, samples are to be taken? So samples should be collected before antibiotics. Try to take uh, microbiological samples as much as possible uh, before starting antibiotics because that is the best time. Uh, this, uh, you normally you insert a cannula to give antibiotics. Most of the time, I mean, if unless you start oral, uh, then of course, when you're entering, say, inserting the cannula, you can take a blood culture. So if you are starting oral antibodies, that means it's not in a, you are not in a hurry, then of course you can take a blood culture before starting giving oral antibodies. So earlier the better. And uh, repeat samples in intermittent presence of pathogens. Like if it is blood that is in endocarditis, bacterial endocarditis, and if it is uh, TB, that's why you take three consecutive days, ideally, uh, sputum, sputum for uh, AFB uh, when you suspect TB. And serology need to be time for the antigen, antibody, uh, su such as uh, antigen, you have to take uh, within the uh, first three to five days. And if it is antibodies, you have to take uh, later on, like five, after five days. I'm sorry, I'm getting so many disturbances in the hospital. Right, and then, <laughs> sorry. And then <clears throat> appropriate specimen. So as we said, 
appropriate specimen is the sample taken before antibiotics <clears throat> from the site of infection, uh, a proposed specimen, sufficient quantity, correct methodology, optimal time, proper container and transported correctly. <clears throat> During the transport, of course, we have to minimize contamination and we have to follow standard precautions because we, it should not get leaked and contaminate the handler's <coughs> handler. We have to be very, be, be very careful, depend on any, any samples sent to the lab, you have to be careful about standard precautions and prevent accidental injuries and maintain the sample in original state. <clears throat> so what are the investigations, bacterial uh, microbiological investigations done in microbiology? So that is initially bacterial studies, mycobacterial studies, fungal studies, viral studies, serology, and molecular diagnostics. So our main intention in this uh, lecture uh, is going to bacterial studies. So microbiology lab, what are the tests done? Blood cultures, CSF, gram stain and cultures, <clears throat> sterile fluids, again, gram stain and cultures, urine cultures, sputum, tracheal aspirates and gram stain, pus, or wound swabs, gram stain and cultures, <clears throat> HVS endocervical swaps, fungal, either scraping or direct smear or culture, other samples like nasal aspirate and all, MRSC screening, stool cultures, Portugal and salmonella. These are the main microbiological samples we do in a uh, uh, microbiology laboratory. So blood in blood cultures, what are the samples you can take? From peripheral vein, we can take a blood culture by venipuncture. From vascular line, central venous line culture, we can take a central line culture and we can take bone marrow biopsy for blood culture as well. So how do you take blood cultures? We have to wash your hands with soap and water and clean with alcohol over and around the selected area and allow to dry. We have to give the time for action. So then <clears throat> clean with 10% povidone iodine in a concentric fashion from the center to the peripheral. These things are, I mean, discussed and uh, uh, whether it's the correct thing and so on. Yes, these are the way we normally follow. So allow at least two to these are the things you have to remember because normally when what happens, we, when we are in a hurry, we just rub with the sob of alcohol and then you rub with povidone iodine and just take the sample. You, you should not do like that because you had to take the action of antisepsis. It takes time. We have to have the contact time. So alcohol, you had to keep for a while until it gets dry. And uh, povidone iodine, you had to keep it at least two minutes to get the action to kill the organism in that area. And then uh, you can use tincture of iodine. Uh, I mean, uh, if it is available, uh, which you can apply in circular motion covering two to, two to three inches or uh, two to three inches would be really big area, but you can apply in um, uh, circular motions. And then of course, use a new pair of disposable or sterile gloves. Here we normally use sterile gloves, but because we are not going to touch the venipuncture site again, it doesn't matter when you if you use disposable gloves. But main thing, you have to wear gloves for your protection. So taking blood culture, we have done all the things aseptically, and we are not going to touch the site of uh, site where we collect blood. In that case, even you can use disposable gloves. Because we always say, don't touch the space you have uh, cleaned earlier. So that's why do not touch or palpate the area after cleansing. So it doesn't matter even you if you wear uh, disposable gloves. And <clears throat> collect five to 10 ml of blood from adult and one to three ml from children. And clean the top of the blood culture bottle with 7% alcohol uh, before uh, uh, putting the uh, inserting the blood and add blood into the bottle aseptically 
and then you have to uh, if it is not uh, if it is a conventional blood culture bottle uh, not a machine one you may have you have to uh, close the bottle tightly and mix well but normally we have all of all almost all the hospital got uh, uh, automated blood culture bottles which you have to uh, uh, mix like in the picture and send to the lab immediately if the lab is closed, keep at room temperature. Never refrigerate blood cultures because we want the organisms to grow in the blood and in the fridge, it will be inhibited. So blood culture collection, as you all know, so blood cultures with contamination. If the blood cultures are contaminated, it delays the correct management. Blood cultures can get contaminated with skin contaminants such as uh, coagulase negative staphylococcus if we don't clean the site properly or if we are if we touch the uh, area again and again with our fingers or ungloved fingers or gloved fingers or whatever because if you get contaminants in the blood it takes another day to get another sample uh, but still the patient must be on antibiotics so it will be not useful waste of resources of course because blood cultures bottles it, everything uh waste of uh, healthcare workers time everything's money and of course most more than that we can't treat the patient correctly how to avoid a septic collection a must so these are the blood culture bottles available these are the conventional ones now we don't almost use them but these are the uh, automated blood culture bottles available in different companies in hospitals. We, they are very effective and uh, the uh, user friendly uh, in, uh, in these situations. Uh, central line blood cultures, the next one, remove the discard the clave contactor, connector, sorry. This is again a problem being done. Clean the hub with alcohol for 15 seconds. So these hubs should be cleaned before taking blood cultures. You have to clean with alcohol for 15 seconds uh, and then followed by a tincture of iodine as in blood cultures and uh, discard 5 ml of blood to clear the line because we have used COVID-19 iodine and alcohol. We have to discard 5 ml and this is discarding of course because we should not don't think about the patients getting anemic because of 3 ml or 5 ml, you have to discard the blood because it has been a practice take, uh, inserting back the, the discarded blood in some, uh, some settings. So using 20 ml syringe, we throw 10 ml, 10 ml of blood for the blood culture and 3 ml for pediatric, one to three ml for pediatrics. Uh, remove iodine with alcohol from the hub with the swab again, clean the, clean the hub again with swab alcohol swap and flush the line as always. Place a new clave connector on the hub. I mean, I can tell these things easily, but when it comes to the practice, the these uh, free uh, extra hubs are not available, it seems. So we have to uh, do something about that. But if you have to use the same hub, uh, at least clean it properly with uh, alcohol for 15 seconds. Just check when you go to the wards whether this is this happens. How many blood, blood cuts to be taken and when this is a question uh, which arises everywhere. So it depends on the condition, unfortunately, and the country situation. Because we can't say take two blood cultures always because we have limited resources. So at least take before starting antibiotics. And for sepsis, try to take two. And uh, one is when you insert the cannula and another one. Uh, Pyrexia are known origin, better to take at least two from different sites, uh, at least one hour apart. Because if it is intermittent uh, shedding, we have to give a little time uh, because it, bacteremia could not be uh, uh, like at the same level. In fever, I mean, always better to take two, but at least one. You have to take if it is you suspect if it is not a viral infection like dengue or something uh, but otherwise 
So don't wait for fever spikes. You don't have to wait for fever spikes to take blood cultures because in the normally in the fever with this fever spikes, cytokines and all will kill the organism. So I take any time before antibiotics. If, if the patient is already on antibiotics, if the patient was transferred to you from another hospital with antibiotics, uh, so if you can't withhold antibiotics, just before the next dose of antibiotic, we can take a sample that is with the minimum uh, drug concentration in the stream. In endocarditis, minimum three, first and last to be taken at least two hours apart. That is the old guideline, it seems, but it's getting, diff getting little uh, uh, ed uh, edited now, it seems. Anyway, you have to take three blood cultures for when you suspect endocarditis. And we get lots of contaminated blood cultures. Therefore, collection is very important. Contaminants should not exceed three to five percent. That is worldwide. But if you check, our contamination rate is going even beyond 20%, which is unacceptable. So please take the blood cultures aseptically. But it's regarding CSF cultures against uh, aseptic conditions. 70% alcohol and povidionidine here, of course. Uh, we have two, initially 70% alcohol, then providonidine. Then, of course, the practice is remove a little bit of providonidine from the side because it can be toxic uh, to the, uh, the spine. Uh, adequate volume we have to take. What is the adequate volume you think? Not a drop or two drops. We have to uh, have a good sample to have a good result three to five ml, because most in most cases, you do the LP after doing a CT. So you don't have to worry worrying about uh, the, the herniating of the brain by taking five ml of CS because it's useful and it's useless if you send one or two drops of CSF for culture, because you can't, because even in severe meningitis, in drop of CSF, there won't be any organism. So at least one to two ml, we need to centrifuge and do the culture. And into a sterilized group pep bottle, trans, trans immediately mention the time of collection. De uh, if it delays, keep it in the room temperature for bacterial. And if it is uh, for, uh, again, for bacteria, never keep in ice, never refrigerate, but for viral studies, in the antigen detection and molecular studies, you, you have to refrigerate. For bacterial, never keep in the fridge. Urine cultures into sterile bottles, you may, all, all of you are familiar with. Uh, clean catch urine sample midstream after cleaning the area, uh, 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 area around the penis or vagina. This is again controversial. Because uh, by cleaning with soap and water, is it necessary? And just with clean water, is it necessary? Would it uh, make the contamination more? Is a query. So clean catch. Ask the patient to pass urine and catch a midstream urine. That is the best sample we can take. So send the lab without delay. If delayed, this is the only sample you need to refrigerate.
So lunch break until 1.15. We will share uh, the certificate link in a while. I'm extremely sorry about this uh, connection problem. Uh, I, I hope you, you can uh, hear me again. Uh, yes, madam, can uh, see. Need right. to make a full screen. I can see as well. Okay, right, thanks. So I'm sorry because somehow the connection is not not great at all. So uh, I was talking about this urine cultures. This is a urine culture uh, plate uh, where organ the, the organisms are grown and where your sample is being uh, streaked on. So we, here in urine, we have to collect, uh, sorry, count the colonies. Here, of course, it's very difficult to count. If you can see, this is single colony, one, two, three, four. I mean, this is about 100. And here you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, so on. So here we have to count. And if the count is more than 10 and 10 and between 100, we say, say 10 to the power four to five. If it is above 100, we say it's 10 to the power five. If it is less than 10 colonies, we say it's not significant. So that's why we want the number of organisms which was there when you took the sample to be to be the same number when you streak the sample. So if you keep it in the room temperature, urine is a very good uh, the, uh, medium, the organism will grow. But if you keep it in the fridge or with the eyes, the number of organisms will not start, I mean, it, it will not grow at least, it will be static. So that's why either you have to send the samples immediately to the lab or else you have to keep it in the fridge and send it later. Uh, and uh, this is again about urine, uh, any uh, sample, normal culture sample, or when you take a catheter sample, in a catheterized patient, you have to clamp the catheter. You can see the pictures. Actually, these pictures were taken by a post intern several years ago, uh, Dr. Samita, who's working in uh, Badulla at the moment. And uh, uh, because we wanted to make, we didn't have any good, nice pictures, so she took it for me. So we had to clamp the catheter five to 10 minutes and catheter tube, you have to, above the bifurcation, clean with 70% alcohol. It's like, kind of like blood, taking blood and use the sterile needle and a syringe, aspirate five to 10 ml. And after the, that, release the clamp and withdraw the needle. So here, never take urine from the bag. You have to take from the catheter itself and uh, follow the uh, correct directions so it will not click if you take it this way. And another sample is a suprapubic sample. Uh, you can take suprapubic as well after cleaning the uh, 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 abdomen, uh, suprapubic area. And uh, now we have seen this picture and we are going to the specimens of wounds. From wounds, we can take tissues, punch biopsies, needle aspirates, sobs, scrapings for fungi. So tissues and biopsy, punch biopsies are better samples as well as needle aspirates of pus. So pus cultures, aspirations or pus swaps. I would, I have written two swaps on each side, one for gram stain and one for culture, but uh, due to the economical issues, we can do one swap only. Why it is important? Because uh, we initially, you know that we, how, how we uh, uh, do the culture swabs, we have to plate in two different plates and we have to uh, 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 the, uh, make a the gram smear as well. So when you uh, streak on the plates and uh, on two plates and then to the slide, the organism will be not the same number and the different, the, even the past cells and all will be different. But if you had two samples, we can do the uh, culture with one and the smear with one. But due to uh, economical issues, we have to uh, spare with one sample. Um, and then wound swaps. All wounds are contaminated. This is a wound you can see. Contaminated, so a positive culture does not automatically indicate the infection. 
So what do you think? Do you have to, how do you take a culture from this wound? Any idea? Can we share your ideas if possible? Quick answer. Uh, how, how are you going to take? I know the answer will take little, uh, if someone can speak and tell, how are you going to take a sample from this wound? Any idea? Okay, right. So I'm telling you that all the wounds are contaminated, even not to, uh, why they said we have more number of uh, uh, organisms than our cells. So we are covered in and out with bacteria, fungi, and so on. So when you take a sample just like that, if you take a swab from this wound, it will contain so many organisms, which are colonizers most of the time. So just having a positive culture, you don't have to treat unless it is infected. So this must be clinically determined based on the wound characteristic. Wound has to be erythematous with edema and pain and warm and uh, increased exudates and uh, smell, so on. I mean, we have to make sure the wound is Infected. So do, do you don't have to take swaps from uh, chronic wounds with some supportive um, cultures to treat system. Uh, waste of resources. So this must be clinically determined based on the wound characteristics. So proper techniques for obtaining specimen is crucial to avoid false negative or false positive results. So how do you take the sample? You have to clean the wound initially. Wash hands, apply gloves, remove soil resin and place it into a biohazard bag. You have to wash your hands because whenever you need, and here you can use pretty well, uh, disposable gloves. Here we use the gloves for our protection because we are going to touch fluid, body fluid. Then you take off the dressing, previous dressing, and then cleanse the wound by removing excess debris from the wound and irrigating. Oh irrigating. Uh, can you please switch off your mic, sphere? So cleanse the wound by removing excess debris from the wound and irrigate with normal saline. Clean the wound with normal saline thoroughly by flushing the wound. Depending on the wound, either you can, here of course you might use the uh, normal saline soap, soaps to clean, clean this wound or you can flush with uh, sterile normal saline. And then gently wipe the excess saline from the wound. And then you can either moisten the uh, swab. Here, here is a swab. You can either moisten with uh, sterile normal saline, but most of the time wounds are a little wettish. You can straight away take a sample. You have to identify a small area, one centimeter clean, viable tissue, not dead tissue. That is not the slough we want. We want viable tissue with organisms. And rot rotate the swab for five seconds and uh, take the sample. Wound culture must be taken from the clean tissue, not from that exudating, dirty area because it will contain organisms, but not important for us to treat the patient. Insert the swab into the sterile container, redress the wound and perform hand hygiene again after removing your gloves. So swabbing methods are different. You can either swab like zigzag or rotational method when you take the sample. Tissues, better samples. And if you take a little tiny, tiny tissue from a wound, if, if you think it will get dry, you can add a little bit of normal saline, sterile, 
and send the sample uh, to the lab. Because if you take a small sample and put into the bottle and send, sometimes it get dried and we don't see the sample inside the bottle. Uh, so again, uh, pus or tissue in sterile wide mouth screw capped container, aspirated pus, pus obtained during syringes. It's a special sample. So uh, because you can't do it again and again, and we, we regard them as precious as well, because we don't discard aspirated specimen for a day, few days, thinking that we might have to do the testing again and again. Um, and uh, if it is tissue infected viable tissue after removing the non-viable stuff. Sputum, sin expectorated sputum, not saliva. You can nebulize the patient for a, a good uh, sample. Why? Because salivary specimen will contain only epithelial cells, that is oral, oral cells, where a good sputum sample will contain pus cells. And you can see this, I mean, salivary, bloody, parulent, and uh, good, uh, good uh, sample, <clears throat> sputum sample. When we do the gram smear, if we see many epithelial cells, we mark it as salivary sample, unsatisfactory. Because we don't, know, we don't want to know the organisms in the oral cavity. We want it from the deep inside, <clears throat> from the lung, alveolar lungs, bronchus at least, yeah? We will see the organisms. You can see organisms that, as well as the pus cells. We count the number of pus cells. If it is about 25 or at least above 15 only, we will proceed with the culture. But otherwise we will send you the report telling it is an unsatisfactory sample and uh, that we don't culture it. But mention if the patient is neutropenic because in neutropenic patients, we might not see enough pus cells over 15 per low power field so that you have to mention that patient is neutropenic in your request form. Ventilated patient, common sample is endotracheal aspirate or bron bile, bronchoalveolar lavage. Uh, and uh, and if, 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 if it is done by a trained person, a consultant or a trained medical officer uh, using fiber optic bronchoscope. And uh, so uh, induced sputum is taken after nebulization with hypotonic saline, because we know that we can test for pneumocystis cerevisiae, which although we can't, uh, we can't grow it, but we can send for other uh, staining and other methods. So in there, you have to nebulize and take the sample. Uh, throat swaps not done very commonly these days. You have to need the tongue depressor, uh, uh, good light, uh, and you take the sample with a sterile cotton swab. Uh, rubbing over the tonsils and postpharyngeal wall and quickly sent to the uh, lab. Or oh, if if getting the red, you have to use a uh, transport medium. For viruses, you should uh, place in a viral transport medium. Nasopharyngeal aspirate, mucoid extract is helpful. Uh, we you must be familiar. You must have seen while during the COVID season um, uh, how samples were taken. Uh, per nasal swabs, flexible uh, wire swab. Uh, we, that again, during the COVID season, you must have see, seen. I'm not going to uh, take much time because I think my time is getting over soon. Uh, so ear swabs, what I need to mention, whatever you take from, when you take exudase and all, clean with normal saline before taking the proper sample because we don't want colonizers. That is the biggest message I want to convey. Even in uh, uh, ear, ear socks, you have to clean the initially with clean with normal saline soaked uh, sock and then send a, a take the sample later. Sinus debris need fungal studies, better accompanied with biopsy. And eye sobs you can take, sterile sob uh, or corneal scraping if you suspect fungal infection and all. You can send the corneal buttons for cultures. Uh, vitreous and aqueous aspirate. So many cultures taken from my awards for cultures and all. Um, urethral specimen. Uh, patients should not pass urine two hours before the sample uh, samples are taken. Uh, and you have to clean the meters with sterile saline because it can contain skin flora. Uh, with sterile soap, 
do post slide bedside inoculation for GC. And uh, chlamydia, as you know, that we don't grow samples, so chlamydia should be sent to the send in transport medium uh, to the STD lab. Endocervical, so again, uh, moisten the speculum with normal saline and insert. Uh, avoid antiseptics or cream because if you use antiseptics, it might not work. I mean, the organism will be killed and the sample will not grow anything. And uh, sample should come from the endocervical cervical area. And gently you have to rotate and swap when the cervical uh, in the cervical canal. Uh, so HP is taken from the posterior phonix and the uh, for normal flora. Uh, so don't call HVS when you take a vaginal discharge from a baby. It is just vaginal discharge. Uh, so normal, we have to check normal flora uh, for epithelial cells, clue cells, candida species, and so on. Um, so we report differently. If you take Vaginal discharge or HVS from a uh, pregnant mother, the sample, you have to mention it because then, of course, we are looking for uh, group B streptococcus, but it is from a post surgical patient. We look for the organism which can cause uh, infections, uh, such as in, even in a wound. So, so it depends. So, we need the history. I'm, I think I am, I am doing over, I have gone over the time. So, we will quickly go through the next slides. I'm really sorry because I had these disturbances. So uh, trichomon trichomon trichomonas vaginalis so should be sent in normal saline. To see the organisms, we want a fresh sample in normal saline because we need to see the movements. Dry soap will not do anything. This is a clue cell. So fungal nasal scraping can be sent in paper. No need for transport media. Uh, you just black onto a black paper. You can scrape into a black paper uh, and fold it and send. Uh, pre antigen is something uh, can be done from the uh, CSF sample or uh, uh, serum even. Um, Aspergillus antibodies can be done from serum and serum galactomanner. And of course, cryptococcal culture can be done from CSF. Anaerobic culture is not done, not done in routine hospitals. We have to send, for, send to the MRI for when we suspect anaerobic. Um, so you have to have the uh, transport medium. But if you don't have a transport medium and you really want to get done uh, anaerobic, get a sterile screw cap, screw, uh, screw capped bottle and top it to the level of the lid so that there is no space for air and, the, uh, and you can send it. PCR, uh, you have to take the sample for, uh, into clean, sterile containers, uh, depending on the condition. And uh, such as you can, uh, you know that we do gene expert tests for TB, TB, TB PCR is called gene expert. Uh, so the sample depends on the condition. So if it is sputum, sputum, if it is blood, blood for PCR and if it is a respiratory sample and depending on the sample, if you don't uh, know how to collect and how to send, always contact the lab. And the antibiotic levels are done in different hospitals, but uh, you have to, uh, because it is not available at the moment, but is, that is something very, uh, very useful thing uh, we have to have. And these uh, just few request form, you have to fill uh, required details, name, age, place, and sample and quit the diagnosis. You don't have to have a, uh, the confirmed diagnosis. This is, we are asking for a probable diagnosis to do our procedure as well. And clinical history, blisters over the groin and so on. This is a nice, uh, nice request form. Uh, take home message, is there a check whether there's an infection before taking microbiological specimen? Uh, and decide, do you want a microbiologist test, even with the infection, say like bronchitis or something, whether you need to have a test? If so, what is the test and how to take and then how to interpret as well? Because just a inter few interpretation, so blood culture, peripheral line, 
no growth after 24 hours. This comes after 24 hours of incubation. So, but the blood cast is getting incubated for another five days. We may contact you because if the organism is in small numbers, it might not grow within the 24 hours. It might grow in two, three days, especially in endocarditis and typhoid. So we may contact you back in a few days time if it becomes positive. Uh, some things like, okay, so this is MRC isolated and how to interpret and all. I think we don't have much time to discuss this, all of these things. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a uh, few, uh, th this is one of uh, Vitek blood, uh, report, sensitivity test report, you might see. Here you can see all the things in the printed form. So organism is Klebsiella pneumoniae and with the sensitivity. And uh, so we mentioned treat according to the ABST and it is a blood culture, the minimum duration of antibiotics is 14 days. So if the blood cultures are positive, we have to, we know that minimal duration is 14 days. It will be several weeks, depending on the diagnosis such as endocarditis. So these are some reports and the interpretation, if it is, uh, so this is SARS-CoV-2 anyway. So when you have to do the testing, when you suspect initial stage viral, you have to do antigen. And if it is after four, four to five days, you have to do antibodies. Then only you can, uh, because if you do antibodies in the last few, first few days, it will be negative. And if you do an antigens on the last few days, it will be negative. So if you want, that's why we want you to mention the duration of fever as well in your reports. So microbiology laboratories normally are open only 8 to 4 p.m. in Sri Lanka. So samples should be received, say, ideally by 2.30. But if it is something like CSF or blood taken from a bad patient, you can contact the lab and send even till 3.30 or even a little later after contacting the lab. This is a normal hours. And any question, you can contact your uh, microbiology team or consultant microbiologists in your hospitals. Thank you and wish you a very, uh, I can't say happy, but useful and uh, product. I would say internship is little hard, but it, it's really good. You'll learn a lot and it, it'll be a uh, very good uh, period. You will uh, you will have hands-on experience and good luck. And uh, you have the courage to face it successfully. Thank you. I'm sorry if I took your time more than I was allocated with my disturbances and all. Thank you for listening and uh, yeah, being there. Although I, I didn't, couldn't ask you questions because my uh, my uh, this internet issues and all, I, I didn't have enough time to discuss with you all. So see you all somewhere in our hospitals as well. I think we are uh, going for lunch. You all must be going for lunch and the next one will be after lunch as I, as I think.
I think we can start at 115 as lunch break until 115. So uh, today we will have the certificate link. So make sure that you are logged in.
Yes, sir. Good afternoon, madam. Uh, Sorry, good afternoon. Uh, shall we start? Uh, still uh, three or four minutes. Shall, are we going to wait for a few minutes or can I share? Yes, madam, we can start sharing. Yes. I hope you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes, ma'am, can see. Okay. Right. So, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so, I'm going to do uh, um, the prevention and management of antibiotic allergies. So, um, so first of all, I would uh, I will give you an introduction. You know, you can recall your basic immunology on uh, hypersensitivity reactions. And uh, I will discuss some type, different types of allergic reactions. And then uh, we will discuss how to approach a patient with a history of antimicrobial allergy and how to manage such a patient. And, um, and then we will discuss how to prevent those adverse e events when administering any antimicrobial. So I will first discuss a few cases with you all. And I would like you to answer. Right? They are like uh, best of four, uh, best of four um, questions. So if you can uh, type your response, the the whether it's one, two, three, or four, in the chat box, right? Um, I'll give about thirty seconds. I'll time and give about thirty seconds. So I'll, I'll be giving you five cases. Okay. Right, so this is the first case. Can you all see? Right, so uh, text your answer in the chat box. So I'm not going to read out. Uh, do you want me to read out? 50-year-old woman with diabetes mellitus but as admitted with fever, vomiting, and swelling of left leg. Past history of allergy to drugs, query antibiotics. On examination, left leg spreading, cellulitis, and signs of sepsis. What is the best way to proceed with regards to antibiotics? So four responses, choose your answers. It's only two answers. Good, so, so most of you all have chosen the third answer and few, uh, I think answer two. You want more uh, time? One answer, the first answer, second answer. Okay. Okay, so time is up. So most of you all have chosen uh, the third answer and some have uh, some have said that the first and the second answers are also correct, right? So this patient is having cellulitis with sepsis, right? So query antibiotic allergy, right? So this is the type of allergy history that you usually see in patients and usually seen in the documents as well. So this is how you sometimes document Al allergy to drugs, very antibiotics, right? So this is the way the antibiotic allergies are documented. So it's very important. The correct answer is answer three, right? So, uh, so evaluation of the allergy history 
right? This is the most important step here, right? Uh, so you can you can uh, start empirical antibiotics, yes, because this patient is on is having sepsis. But before that, right? Ask you know pro, you know uh, the basic history, right? Is the most important thing. Right? So what is the type of uh, reaction? What type of symptoms the patient had? And the time relationship, right? Uh, so with the, how long ago the reaction was and how was it managed, right? After which dose? So those are the things that you should ask from the uh, patient before deciding on the antibiotic. So the first, the most important thing is the evaluation of allergy history in this patient, okay? Right. Second case. Forty-eight-year-old woman was admitted for excision of lipoma in, in the hand. She has a recorded history of allergy to paracetamol, fluoxetine, metformin, and glibenkramide. So, following surgery, they wanted to start an antibiotic. So, what is the next best step in her management? Please. Uh, Text your answers in the chat box. So, some are typing as four, three, okay, four and three. Yeah, so most are most think that the fourth dance is correct. Some say third dance is correct. Right. Right. So now we'll stop and discuss. Okay. Right. So here, right now, um, she has a record. Right. So these are real patients that we see. So uh, she has a record of uh, with her saying that she's allergic to paracetamol, fluoxetine, and those two anti-diabetic drugs. And they wanted to start an antibiotic. So um, so what is the thing that you, you think is the best here? Does she need antibiotics? Because it's a clean surgery, right? So does she need antibiotics for healing of the wound? I don't think so. This patient needs antibiotics. So usually antibiotic prophylaxis, even if it's given, it's just one dose, right? But here, I don't think that this patient needs an antibiotic, okay? So, so there is a recorded history of allergy. So you can't use uh, fluoxetine or related penicillins or a cross-reactive like similar cephalosporins, right? So coamoxiclav, I don't think is suitable because it's a uh, penicillin, right? So vancomycin can be started, but it's not indicated here because it's just an excision of lipoma, right? And then she was actually referred to us for allergy evaluation, okay? Right, so we'll discuss the next quiz. So 53-year-old woman with diabetes mellitus awaiting abdominal hysterectomy under GA. So she had again a record of history, uh, history uh, with record of allergy to amoxicillin, cloxicillin, kefiroxim, and clarithromycin. Now, how to proceed now? Now she's awaiting surgery. She, uh, it's a routine surgery. So what are you going to do now? Text your answers, please, again in the chat box. Okay, most say it's one. Okay, two. Right. Okay, so most of you all are saying the first answer is correct. Right, now we'll stop and discuss. Okay, so 
it's the first answer, right? So now this patient is awaiting a surgery. So it's a routine surgery. So you, the patient can be given a date. So first you have to uh, he, uh, evaluate the allergy first, right? Because she has got a history of allergy to so many types of antibiotics, different classes of antibiotics. So multiple antibiotics. So she needs to be evaluated properly by an immunologist. So that's what they have done. Uh, so she needs uh, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis during surgery, right? So the surgeons were very you know, scared to give up antibiotic. And also she, she, they wanted to test for GA drugs as well, but I didn't check. But uh, they wanted to uh, test for antibiotics, for these antibiotics whether she was allerg really allergic to, right? So that was the, uh, manage the, the management of that patient. First, um, you have to evaluate the allergies properly before deciding on an uh, antibiotic for prophylaxis because it's just a routine surgery, okay? Right, so next case. Four-year-old child was treated for a low respiratory tract infection with IV ceftriaxone and he developed angioedema of face, vomiting and SOB within two minutes of administration of the first bolus dose. VP was normal, SpO2 90% and uh, they have a wrong cut. What is the most important initial step? So please text your answer. I want all of you to answer this question. Okay. I want all of you to answer, most of you all, at least 50% to answer this question. I see a lot of twos, and there was one four. Two fours. That's all? Right. Right, okay. So the second answer, right? So this is what? What is this? Sorry, I think I was disconnected for a moment. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Hello. Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. So the so sorry, I got disconnected. Right. So this is anaphylaxis. Okay. So most of you all had got the correct answer. You most of you all had saved this 
would have saved this child, right? By giving IM adrenaline. So that is the drug of choice for uh, um, anaphylaxis. It's not hydrocortisone, right? Hydrocortisone doesn't have any action in the immediate stage, right? And it's not clofenaramine or piritin, right? Because it doesn't have any action on um, systemic symptoms. It's, it can, you know, relieve the uh, cutaneous symptoms, the urticaria or um, sometimes angioedema, but not the systemic symptoms. So you have to give IM adrenaline to save this child, right? So you can give oxygen, you can give, or can nebulize, but the first most important thing is to give the adrenaline, right? So that you, if, by giving adrenaline, you can save this child, okay? Right, so next patient, a 70-year-old frail man, uh, with diabetes, was admitted with an abscess in left thigh with surrounding cellulitis, no history of allergies in the past. The attending clinician decided to give IV penicillin. So what is the best way of managing this patient? I want you all to, again, text your answer in the chat box. Please text your answer in the chat box. So I see one's coming up four, three, one, four. Okay. Consider a number of ones and fours. Three. A okay, few threes. Okay, so you have chosen, I think, all the answers. Okay, right, four. Lot of ones and lot of fours, I think. Yeah, so we'll stop now. Right, so now this patient has got an abscess with cellulitis and a diabetic patient is a frail man right so uh, now we have decided to give penicillin right so do you all do sts for penicillin now this patient hasn't got a uh, history of allergies in the past right so do you need to do st what is st skin testing right so that is the routine practice with penicillin which is very wrong, right? So this is the, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is the only country which does this, you know, the wrong practice of doing an ST before giving penicillin, right? If there is a no, if there is no history of allergies in the past for any antibiotic, you don't need to do skin testing for any antibiotic, right? But if there is a history of allergy, you can decide what to do. Right, but with no history of allergies in the past for any antibiotic, you don't do any skin skin testing, right? So that's a very wrong practice, which is done uh, like in almost all in institutions, right? You should try and avoid doing such wrong practices, right? So ST is not indicated here because no past history of allergies, right? So now, as he was, he's having a uh, abscess, right? So you start antibiotics because you don't, you don't want to wait. Uh, this is a diabetic patient, very old patient, right? Cellulitis, so you don't want to wait. Uh, so you start and you have to consider draining an abscess. So you always, when there's a collection of pus, right? You have to get rid of that pus. Right, because the antibiotics won't penetrate the pus. Um, uh, so it's important that you have to control the source of infection. So you have to get rid of all the pus or necrotic tissue or whatever, 
right? So source controlling is important, um, as important as giving antibiotics in this patient, right? So the answer is three, right? Okay, so we will now, uh, we have, sorry, right. So antibiotic hypersensitivity or allergies are commonly overreported. This is one thing that is commonly overreported, right? So some conditions that we know in medicine are misdiagnosed, right? But this is overdiagnosed usually, right? So most of the patients who are labeled as allergy are found to be uh, found to be tolerating the drug, the culprit drug, when they are properly evaluated and tested and challenged, right? So, um, so the problem with allergies, especially with allergy to antibiotics, is the diagnosis, right? So the diagnosis of uh, this condition is challenging because the facilities are not available. And the treatment of these patients, again, is a nightmare sometimes, right? Sometimes they come up with a lot of allergies. So you can't decide on what to give, right? So it's a uh, very difficult uh, thing to decide when the patient says that uh, he or she is allergic to some antibiotics, especially if they are allergic to multiple antibiotics. So this often causes fear and anxi anxiety in the patients as well as the doctors. And so you, you, um, you always practice the defensive medicine in these patients. Right? So you try to start an alternative treatment, an inf usually an inferior second line uh, uh, antibiotic over the first line, right? So maybe not very effective as the first line. So this can affect the patient management, morbidity and mortality. Right, so allergies uh, can be immune mediated, right? So uh, they can be mediated by antibodies or T cells, or sometimes they can be non-immune mediated. So those are earlier known as pseudoallergic uh, or anaphylactoid reactions, right? So these are uh, non-immune mediated reactions. They don't involve any antibodies or T cells, okay? So sometimes they can uh, present similar to anaphylaxis. So that condition is known as non-immunologic anaphylaxis. So earlier, uh, termed as anaphylactoid reactions, right? So they can present exactly similar to anaphylaxis, but they are not immune mediated. They don't involve any antibodies or T cells. So this is due to direct activation of mast cells or basophils by the drug without involving antibodies. Now you have to remember that when you start an antibiotic, it's not always the, the, the presenting Symptoms and signs may not be due to an allergy, right? So uh, you can, you know, the patients might develop side effects, known side effect to the drugs, right? Or intolerance or idiosyncrasy or drug-to-drug -to -drug in interactions, right? So so many things can happen when you start an antibiotic. So you can't always, uh, you know, think of allergies when they present with a symptom, right? Now, this is... Um, the record with which the patient, third patient came with, right? So this, if you can remember this patient, I told you a 53 year old patient, right? Who is awaiting hysterectomy. So this was the record, her allergy record, right? Allergy to piritin, plus, 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 and the list of antibiotics that I've mentioned here and some herbal meds and ketotifen, fexofenadine. So when I asked the patient what happens when she takes piritin or fexofenadine, she says that she develops excessively sleepy and drowsy, right? So there are known side effects of um, antihistamines, okay? So, you know, similarly, you know, other drugs also have, you know, very subjective um, symptoms. Right, so this is how you create allergy labels. Okay, so you have to be careful when you record an allergy, especially to a drug. 
Right, so uh, these allergy labels are very common, right? It's about 10 to 25% in Western countries. And they can be, uh, you know, uh, created in two ways. So patients themselves report uh, that they are allergic to some antibiotic, right? So these are very ambiguous, very subjective uh, symptoms, or they could be just a historical event, a childhood event, and the patient can't remember exactly what happened, or it could be just a family history. Some family member had a reaction, or they may misinterpret not non-allergic side effects, right? Um, or intolerance or symptoms, some, some infections can have rashes, right? Especially viral infections, uh, they can have various rashes. So, so they can misinterpret those side effects or uh, infections uh, with the allergy, right? And the second way of creating allergy labels is by, you know, it's by from our side, right? So we document these allergies very inadequately. So we don't, we, we always ask. Sorry, I think I'm getting disconnected. Sorry about that. Our faculty Wi-Fi. Sorry about that. I'm going to share that again. Sorry, extremely sorry. Right, hope you all can uh, hear me properly now. Sorry about that. Okay, right. Uh, so we can create allergy labels. Right, because if we don't get the allergy history properly, right, and sometimes so when when you record an allergy in in the BHT, it goes to the uh, diagnosis card, and the patient carries that diagnosis card everywhere and show that every time she uh, gets a medicine. So you don't then uh, reevaluate that diagnosis, right? So we don't uh, clarify uh, those labels again when we. So when we want to start an antibiotic, so if the patient has a diagnosis card of saying allergy to amoxicillin, you don't clarify that uh, allergy, right? So that is how we can create allergy labels and act upon allergy labels without any clarification. And we can also overestimate the cross-reactivity between different antibiotics. You think that, okay, if the patient says allergy to uh, amoxicillin, so you, you overestimate the cross-reactivity between other beta lactams. And even if the patient had a true IgE-mediated, a true allergic reaction, right, they tend to like um, uh, get rid of it within a few years, right? So about 80% of the patients who had a true reaction, true IgE-mediated reaction, become tolerant to the drug after a decade, after 10 years. Right, so even if they had a reaction in the past, they may be able to tolerate that culprit drug. My slides are also not moving. Right, so these are some bad implications of allergy labels. So we tend to use reserved antibiotics in these patients, broad spectrum antibiotics like carbapenems and fluoroquinolones. We tend to use multiple antibiotic combinations intravenously and longer duration of therapy poor concordance with guidelines, right? And higher readmission rates, higher ICU admissions, and increased length of stay, which can all um, cause uh, these, you know, very bad implications, very bad effects 
on antibiotic resistance, development of antibiotic resistance, because we tend to uh, start preserved broad spectrum antibiotics in these patients. So MRSA, ESBLs, VRE, and also they are more prone to get clostridium death. So these are proven facts. And these patients have a higher morbidity and mortality because you tend to start a second line inferior antibiotics over the first line, and it can cause uh, increased cost of treatment. So just to you know, give you an uh, idea of the different types of allergic reactions, if you can um, you know, recall your immunology, basic immunology uh, lectures that you had during third or fourth year, Right, so there are um, different types of hypersensitivity reactions. Those are immune-mediated hypersensitivity reactions. So basically, the react the immune-mediated reactions can be divided into two types: the immediate reactions, which happen within minutes, usually within minutes, but they say up to an hour. Now, uh, it has you know the duration has um, they have increased the duration to six hours within six hours of starting a drug, right? And the other category is non-immediate, or the reactions. Now they say after six hours um, are uh, non-immediate reactions, right? So the immediate reactions are due to type one IgE-mediated uh, reactions. So they can present as anaphylaxis, urticaria, angioedema, bronchospasms, hypertensions, etc. Usually within minutes. That's why they are called immediate. And the non-immediate reactions can be type two reactions, type two hypersensitivity due to cytotoxic reactions, and they cause usually cause uh, lymphopenias, anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, usually after uh, several days of treatment. Then type three reactions are due to immune complexes, and again uh, after several days into the treatment, they develop serum sickness like illnesses. Uh, like fever and uh, cutaneous eruptions, vasculitis, drug fevers. So those are try type three, which usually happens after days or weeks of treatment. Then type four is different to all other reactions because they are T cell mediated rather than antibody mediated. And there are so many types of type four reactions which can occur with drugs. So the, the most common presentation is macular papilla or mobiliform rash after starting antibiotics. So this can happen after days or weeks of treatment. Or they can sometimes have contact dermatitis with the antibiotics, fixed drug eruptions, acute generalized exanthematous pastylosis or dress, Stephen Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So some of these are called severe cutaneous adverse reaction or SCAR. Uh, the last four, acute generalized exathemus pastylosis, DRESS, SJS, and 10 are called severe cutaneous adverse reactions, right? So they, have, they tend to occur after several days uh, or sometimes several, after several hours, right? So uh, you should, you know, for in systemic... Uh, sorry, severe cutaneous adverse reactions, you should avoid all these drugs again uh, and all the cross-reacting drugs. Okay, so these are the types of uh, hypersensitivity reactions and the presentations. Now we'll go through some of the common antibiotics to cause reactions. Uh, the beta-lactams are the most common implicated antibiotic group to cause allergic reactions, particularly the penicillin groups, amoxicillin, uh, piperacillin, right, and so on, and the cephalosporins, right? And then fluoroquinolones, vancomycin and aphotericin D, I will discuss very briefly. Now, penicillins, now the rep reported rate of penicillin allergy is very, very high. It's about 5 to 15%. But as I said before, most of these patients, more than 95% of these patients could tolerate uh, penicillin, that culprit penicillin when they're tested. Uh, so the cross-reactivity between other beta-lactam has also been overestimated. So uh, the, the cross-reactivity is more with the first and second generation cephalosporins than the third and fourth generation cephalosporins. Right? So, the, so if, you, if somebody is truly allergic to amoxicillin, so you should avoid the first and second generation cephalosporins. The cross-reactivity with carbapenems is very, very low. 
And the cephalosporin allergies, the reported rate is very much lower than the reported rate for penicillins. And again, the cross-reactivity between different cephalosporin is very rare due to the heterogeneity of their side chain. So the most of the reactions are directed to the side chain of the cephalosporin, right? So you have to avoid the re-exposure to the same cephalosporin or other beta-lactam with the same side chain. Right? And again, the cross-reactivity with carbapenems less than 1%. And as I said before, uh, even if the patient had a true Ig-mediated reaction, uh, they tend to grow out of their allergies after 10 years. Now, this is to show the, uh, the structure of the beta-lactams. You can see the, the, the beta-lactam ring is shared. Uh, so all beta-lactams have the beta-lactam ring. And the different beta lactams have different side chains, the R1 side chains, the structure is different. So uh, the cross reactivity is mainly directed to the R1 side chain. So you have to uh, choose an antibiotic. So if a patient is allergic, uh, 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 reported allergic to a beta lactam, so you have to uh, avoid a cross reactive uh, beta lactam. So you have to know. What are the cross uh, similar the anti beta lactams with similar side chains R1 side chains? So if uh, there is a penicillin allergy history, you should avoid all penicillins. That is penicillins, amoxicillins, cloxicillins, coamoxiclav, right? And the first and second generation cephalosporins. So if somebody is allergic to first and second generation cephalosporins, you should avoid penicillins and first and second generation cephalosporins. And if somebody is allergic to third generation cephalosporins, usually uh, they can cross react between third generation cephalosporins, different, different uh, antibiotics in the same group, and also with the fourth generation cephalosporins. So you have to avoid third and fourth. And if they are fourth generation, similarly, they can cross react with third generation cephalosporins. The carbapenems usually don't cross-react with any of the penicillins and third um, cephalosporins, but they can cross-react with each other. So the cross-reactivity with other uh, beta-lactams is very rare. And the least reactive antibiotic in the beta-lactam group is astronam. So it has a completely different structure to all other uh, beta-lactams except keftazidine. So they share the same structure. So astrionam, so it's the safest anti-beta-lactam. If it's available, it's not available at the moment, but it's the safest uh, beta-lactam to give because it has a completely different structure. Right, so fluoroquinolones, now the incidence has increased because we use fluoroquinolones a lot. Now the true IgE-mediated anaphylaxis is very, very rare with fluoroquinolones. So the most reactions which are reported are due to direct mast cell activation by the drug, right? So this is due to um, a drug directly acting on mast cells and activating mast cells to release the uh, histamines and other mediators, right? So they don't involve any IgE. So they don't have memory, right? So even if they had a reaction, they may tolerate the same drug again, right? Because they don't have memory but it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate between a true anaphylaxis and this non-immunologic anaphylaxis because the presentation is exactly similar, right? And there are no tests to uh, differentiate between a true anaphylaxis and a non-immunologic anaphylaxis. Even the trip test can be high in both types of patients, right? Uh, so they can present similar to anaphylaxis. So there can be cross-reactivity between different fluoroquinolones, and vancomycin, uh, you may have seen this red man syndrome with vancomycin. It's a common uh, side effect if you give vancomycin uh, very rapidly. If you give infusions very rapidly, about one third of these patients will develop red man syndrome. So red man is an itchy um, rash you get in the upper toes and in the face, right? Um, so it's again not due to IgE right, Ig-mediated reactions is due to direct mast cell activation. So no IgE is involved, so no memory. So if you give the uh, infusion slowly, right, the patients can tolerate, right? So even if the patient had a reaction to vancomycin, right, you give 
the infusion slowly. You start the infusion slowly. You can even pre-medicate with the uh, uh, piritin, uh, clofidinamine, if you want, oral or IV. And then you can restart the vancomycin infusion very, very slowly, right? Uh, so, uh, so vancomycin, in addition to causing this red band syndrome, can cause dress. Okay, so it's one of the uh, uh, common drugs to cause stress. Right, so if you had a patient with red band syndrome, what you can do is to slow down the uh, infusion rate, right? So you can pre-medicate with an antihistamine, right? Uh, so you slowly give the uh, uh, infusion, even if they had a reaction, right? And because the, these patients don't have a memory response. Right, and for tyrosine, same story. Uh, again, the true IgE-mediated reactions are very rare, and again, the reactions are due to um, uh, infusion, right? Rapid infusion. So they are all, uh, most of the reactions are infusion-related reactions. So usually they have these reactions, the uh, infusion-related reactions happen very quickly, right, with the first dose. So, so they tend to level off after repeated administration. So we have to uh, slow down the infusion rate, right? And this, uh, the reactions are less with the newer liposomal preparations. Right, so some patients, they have this multiple drug allergy syndrome, right? It's about, so these are mostly females, right? We see lots of females coming with this multiple drug allergy sy syndrome. Uh, so they have allergies to different classes of antibiotics, not so it's totally unrelated antibiotics. And usually they have anxiety and some somatic illness. Right. So they may have this differential histamine release, right? So they have a true reaction. Actually, it's not just a you know, like a false complaint, right? So they get a reaction, right? Uh, to completely unrelated drugs. Uh, Right, so how to approach a patient with allergy, right? First, the clinical history is the most important first step, right? And then you can uh, do, you know, refer the patients for some investigations, allergy evaluation, skin prick test, intradermal test and graded challenge. So these tests are done uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, Ragama and MRI, Colombo. So you can refer these patients for these tests if you think uh, they are indicated. And you can order specific IgE, they are available for beta lactams, uh, but very expensive and they are very non-specific and um, has a very low sensitivity. And then if you uh, have a patient with uh, anaphylaxis, to confirm anaphylaxis, you can do a serum trip test. So you have to ideally send the sample within one to two hours of the reaction, right? So you can see that this graph, showing the peak level coming uh, around one hour of the reaction, right? So you have to take the sample at one hour, so ideally, uh, and then you have to repeat uh, at least after 24 hours to see the, the, uh, the levels uh, come back to normal because there is a condition, um, uh, uh, mass, mass cell activation. So some people have this uh, mastocytosis to exclude that, you have to uh, prove that the patient's uh, uh, serum triptase level come back to normal after 24 hours. So if you can at least send the sample within one to two hours of the reaction, uh, I think you can confirm, but this is only available in the private sector. Right, so in the history, what are the things that you need to ask? What is the implicated drug and the root of uh, the drug? that was given and what are the symptoms and the symptoms are of immediate reaction, symptoms of a late reaction or symptoms of scar or skin, symptoms of anaphylaxis. And what was the timing? So timing is very, very important within minutes or hours or days of uh, administering the drug. Was it after, after the first dose or after multiple doses? So if it is with the first dose, it's most probably uh, IgE mediated or a uh, non-IgE mediated uh, anaphylactoid reaction whether there were other medications administered at the same time, or whether there are other cofactors like infections, NSAIDs, alcohol, because they can cause a similar reaction, and how was the tre reaction treated, uh, whether it was treated with uh, adrenaline, 
uh, or antihistamines, just antihistamines, and whether the patient had tolerated similar antibiotics since the reaction. So sometimes, so they have a record of allergy to penicillin or amoxicillin, and they have taken comamoxiclav afterwards. So, uh, you know, you have to ask whether the patient could tolerate any other, you know, similar antibiotics after that reaction. Right, so this is the, uh, just to show this is a very, you know, uh, kind of a very uh, cramped up uh, slide, but just to show you what to do when you have a patient with allergy history, right? So if it's just a low risk history, right? So you, do, you don't think it's an allergy, right? Just a family history, non-allergic symptoms. You don't need to do anything. You can start the antibiotic that you want, right? The first line antibiotic. And if the reaction is very remote, happened more than 10 years ago, just a um, pruritus, itchy, right? Then you can challenge the patient with amoxicillin. Right? You can give a dose of amoxicillin and see whether the patient develops the reaction, right? So most of the time they don't. And moderate risk patients, they have this mild urticaria rash, right? Symptoms similar to IG reactions, right? But not anaphylaxis. So ideally, these patients should be referred for skin trick testing to confirm uh, a type one reaction. But if you don't have, uh, you know, uh, facilities, you can again do a graded challenge, right? You start with a slow, uh, very low dose, and gradually increase the dose. Right, and if the patient is a high risk patient who had a uh, anaphylactic reaction or severe urticaria, severe angioedema, or recurrent reactions, you have to do uh, aller proper allergy evaluation by skin prick test. Now, these skin prick tests are done uh, for beta lactam antibiotics only, so they are validated for beta lactam antibiotics. So, for penicillin, you have to ideally do the skin prick test with the major determinant and the minor determinant. So these are the two metabolites which are responsible for these allergic reactions. So we have to include those two in the allergic panel. So uh, if the skin prick test is negative, you can then proceed to do the intradermal test and to get the 100% accuracy. So if you the skin prick test negative, intradermal test negative, then you can do a graded challenge in those patients. Right, so this is how you do. So the skin prick test and intradermal test, you have to include a positive control and a negative control. The positive control is histamine and negative control is saline. So you put the drops of antibiotics, these major minor determinants and the culprit drug, drug in the correct dilution, right? So if you do it with incorrect dilutions, it can cause an irritant reaction, right? So you have, there are, uh, you know, uh, recommended uh, dilutions for each of the antibiotic. So you have to use that recommended dilution for each of the antibiotic uh, for the skin prick test as well as for the intradermal test. So if you do it with uh, incorrect dilutions, you can get an irritant reaction which could give a false positive uh, test result, right? And always include a positive and a negative control with skin prick and the intradermal testing, right? So this is how to do the Correct. This is the correct way to do the skin prick test and the intradermal test, skin testing for beta lactams. Right. So this is only done for beta lactams. I repeat, it's only done for beta lactams. So I know that in some stations, you know, when some you know incident happens, they test for all the drugs, all the antibiotics, even vanco, genta, gentamicin, vancomycin. They do this, you know, uh, with uh, in inaccurate dilutions. Right, with high dilution, so they get an irritant reaction. Okay. So you first do the skin prick test and then proceed to do the intradermal test and the drug challenge. So that will increase the accuracy. Right, so this should be only done in patients with a history of allergy, right? Not in all patients who want to start an antibiotic, even with penicillin. Only if there's a history of allergy by an experienced person appropriate setting where you can manage a reaction with correct non-irritant concentrations and interpreted carefully with positive and negative controls. So, so that's why the penicillin ST, which is done in Sri Lanka, is completely irrational, right? So you should stop that practice. 
Right. So grade a challenge, even you can do in the uh, ward setting, in a low risk or moderate risk patients, you start with the one tenth dose of the drug. Right. So usually amoxicillin, you can use amoxicillin pediatric suspension, one tenth dose, and then you wait for 30 minutes and you can divide the rest of the dose into two or three doses, right? So after 30 minutes, you give about, um, uh, you know, if you start, if you want to, adult patient, you give about 50 uh, milligrams as a starting dose, and then uh, you can give about 100, right? And then you can get the rest after 30 minutes. So after you give the last dose, uh, you have to observe the patient for one hour, at least one hour, right? You can do this graded challenge in low risk patients and moderate risk patients. Now, these are the tests that we did for the case one, this patient who had a uh, cellulitis with sepsis, right? Uh, this, the, the history says the amoxicillin allergy, very remote history, rash and itching, and they did a uh, graded challenge with amoxicillin, and this patient was treated with coamoxiclav later. Uh, and this patient who had uh, undergone excision of lipoma and they wanted to start an antibiotic post-op, and she was referred, this patient was re referred, and uh, she was started actually in the ward, she was started on coma. Sorry, I'm getting uh, late to, is that okay? I, can I have five minutes more, please? Because I was getting disconnected uh, time to time, I'll take only five minutes more, right. So they have actually started coamoxiclav and patient had developed a reaction. So she was referred. So in this patient, the skin prick test was negative, but the gradient challenge was positive. So we did a placebo challenge and the placebo was negative. So she she was, she, so the rec, we report the results as uh, allergy to coamoxiclav. So to avoid uh, coamoxiclav in future. Now, so this patient who was awaiting a, a surgery, uh, hysterectomy. So again, this patient was having multiple antibiotic allergies, different types, and some of them um, look like uh, type 1 reaction. So we did uh, further investigation, SPT, the skin prick test, all were negative and intradermal tests were negative and did an oral amoxicillin challenge and she could uh, very well tolerate the, tolerate the, uh, she could uh, tolerate the amoxicillin, right? So she was delabeled. So the, she was uh, given uh, cefiroxim or coamoxiclav during surgery, surgical prophylaxis. And this patient, uh, this child who was treated with ceftriaxone had, a, had an anaphylaxis. And this baby was treated with IV clofenaramine only, not with uh, adrenalines, fortunately survived, and then was referred uh, for skin prick testing. And uh, he, he became positive for skin prick test. Kefraxone was positive, so uh, confirmed Ig mediated allergy. So very quickly on anaphylaxis, so you have to know how to identify a patient with anaphylaxis. So there are laid guidelines by European Allergy and Immunology Societies and the World Allergy Organizations and various uh, criteria to diagnose anaphylaxis. So if you have a doubt, Right. If you uh, if you think that this is whether this is you can't just you know you think it's anaphylaxis but you know you are not very sure, then give adrenaline. Right. So benefit of the doubt, give adrenaline. Okay. So if you are not very sure, adrenaline will not cause any harm if you give it IM. Right. It's very safe to give IM because we sometimes prescribe epipen or self-administered adrenaline to patients to for them to get uh, adrenaline at home, right? So you don't be afraid to give adrenaline, right? So even that baby who, who had an anaphylactic reaction was not treated with adrenaline, but fortunately survived, right? So immediately, if you think it's anaphylaxis, if, if they had these you know, symptoms of anaphylaxis, give IM adrenaline so that you can save a life. Right, so usually there's some patients, not all present with skin symptoms. Right, about 10% will not have skin manifestations, so they have respiratory manifestations, uh, cardio cardiovascular manifestations, 
And some patients can have GI manifestations, right? So there are late guidelines. So the, the management is IM adrenaline, right? 0.5 ml, one in thousand, right? So different doses for pediatric, uh, for children, right? So you can save a life if you give IM adrenaline, okay? Right, so how to prevent the last slide? So how to prevent adverse effects or hypersensitive reactions with antibiotics? So you have to uh, minimize uses of antibiotics as much as possible, only for true indications, right? So stop irrational prescribing. So minimize IV administration, right? Because IV can cause more reactions than oral, right? So if the patient is stable, you can always start oral antibiotics. If there is no indication to start IV, right? Only indicated. If indicated, you start IV. And if you think IV is indicated, you have to refer the manufacturer's leaflet for administration, how to give the IV, right? Whether in infusion, or slow boluses. So most of the antibiotics are given as slow boluses over three to five minutes or as IV infusions. And you have to uh, select the correct dilu diluents for infusions, right? You have to always um, uh, read the manufacturer's uh, instructions, okay? And you have to always check the compatibility with other drugs and solutions and inform the patient and instruct the patient when you prescribe an antibiotic to look for any adverse effect and to report, right? So you just, you know, if, if, you are, if they are uh, prescribed an antibiotic, you inform that they are given an antibiotic and report if they, are, they get any adverse effects. And then if you, uh, you know, if you decided to give IV, if you have decided to give IV, then you have to observe the uh, patient after IV administration for, um, uh, adverse effects, especially hypersensitivity. So you don't let the patient to get down immediately after giving an IV injection, okay? So, uh, so the take-home messages, antibiotic allergies, they are mostly over-reported, misinterpreted and unverified. So they can cause serious implications on antibiotic stewardship and uh, antibiotic resistance. So best management option should be uh, decided by evaluating the patient properly. In the history, from the history, you have to evaluate the patient properly, right? Assess the risk, right? And then uh, consider the cross-reactivity between different antibiotics, right? And if the patient has signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, and you, if you are uh, having doubts whether the patient is having anaphylaxis, you treat with IM adrenaline. Okay, you can save the life. Right, so that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've taken 10 minutes uh, more. Nine minutes. Right, uh, thank you very much, madam. So uh, we are coming to the last lecture for the day. It's by Dr. Geetika Patapadigi, consultant microbiologist yes. at National Hospital Colombo. So on antibiotic resistance. So. Sorry, uh, prevention of hospital acquired ignition. Yes, Over sir, to you, madam. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I will. Can you all see it now? You're not uh, sharing, Madam, yet. Uh, Have you opened the presentation, Madam? I opened it. 
Okay, uh, once you open it, there is a green button on the lower panel saying share screen. You press that, it then you go to the uh, relevant me. presentation. That's need to be blue color once you tap on it. Then you press the right, left, right corner share button. Yeah, share. Yeah. Uh, then I have to go for screen. Yeah. Can you see it now? No, madam. Can you see it now? No. Nope. Oh. Not yet, madam. Share screen. Can you oh, see the share screen button? Yeah. My screen. Ah, oh, it's coming. Ah, yes. It's coming. Ah, yeah. oh, no, yours. Yes, phone screen or? Are you on the phone? Oh, I don't know. It's the phone. It's phone. Uh, so it's a, uh, you can't see your uh, presentation, madam. Your phone screen. Ah, yes. Yes. Now, can yeah, you now, see? Yes. yes can, can you? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, but loud and clear. You can start. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, the topic given to me is regarding prevention of... Good afternoon, everybody, first of all. Uh, then this is on prevention of healthcare-associated infections. So, you know that uh, hospital is a very... I think uh, the slide's moving. Hello? Are the slides moving? Yes, yes, moving, madam. Yeah. So the hospital is a very busy place. So there are a lot of uh, antibiotics in use. And uh, bacteria, there, you know, there is a fight between the microorganisms and antibiotics in such a hospital because a lot of antimicrobials are being used and a lot of uh, infections, other things happening in when they are being used in large numbers. So all of us know that uh, the antibiotics pipeline is dry because of the resistance of antibiotics. The number of uh, newly manufactured antibiotics are coming very low because it is uh, very profitable for them to manufacture something else other than antimicrobials because once they are produced within six months, one year or many years, they become resistant. Uh, so the only option we are left with is uh, in our, as medical professionals and other professionals, uh, to be aware about this development of resist, uh, resistance due to irrational use of antibiotics. So there are quite a number of awareness days and weeks. So I am not going to, uh, there is something called antibiotic awareness week coming in next month. One week, we it's advocacy day. We make the people aware. See, it is not the only week we should do this, but that is an advocacy day. So, it is our prime duty to stop the spread of antibiotic resistance. So, as a single person, you cannot do. We work as a team. So, we work as a medical nursing and other professional team. So team, me, together, everyone achieves more. So in hospitals, in ward or whatever, any other unit, wherever we are, we work as a team to get more strength. So there is a national strategic plan also with AMR from 2017 to 2022, having many strategies there. It is uh, actually uh, as uh, the new version will come beyond 2022 because this is 2023 up to 2025. So they are, I'm not going to explain about this strategic plan, but it, there is an important thing related to our topic. That is in there, there is a strategy three, which is reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures. So it is minimizing the risk of 
one getting healthcare associated infection so hospital acquired infections healthcare associated infections and also comial all are the same so it is an important strategy for us we are talking about it now so that is to ensure the safety of everybody not only the healthcare worker not only the patient or the visitor is safety of all people working together so we give priority to patients at the same time the safety of the healthcare worker also should be assured so for that we have the common saying prevention is better than costly cure so what we aimed as is to prevent the hospital associated infection healthcare associated infection so what are healthcare associated infections they are acquired either by patients or healthcare workers during their stay in the hospital and healthcare workers while working in the hospital so they are healthcare associated infections are infections occurring in a patient during the process of care in a hospital or other healthcare facility at the time of admission to the hospital no such infection at the time of admission and even not incubating at the time of admission they develop after admission and even sometimes they can appear after discharge especially for cardiothoracic surgeries uh, they stay for a long time even after one year say they are exceptional cases so it includes occupational infections of one staff as well for the diagnosis of healthcare associated infection where we can't just if there is pus in a surgical site infection we can't just say it is healthcare associated infection so we have to follow some criteria for the diagnosis they are well documented in the cdc national health safety network diagnostic criteria there so for the diagnosis of for instance ventilator associated pneumonia central line associated blood stream infection and catheter associated urinary tract infections different types of infections are there there are said criteria in this cdc nhs in diagnostic criteria so these develop these healthcare associated uh, infections develop on or after third calendar day of admission to the facility it is generally 48 to 72 hours after admission to a healthcare facility however infection prevent uh, if an infection is available on admission it may be healthcare associated the patient had been hospitalized previously within 90 days and uh, the criteria all elements have to be there so healthcare why are we talking about healthcare associated infections because they increase patient suffering and it can cause person permanent disability some become permanently bedridden so meningitis causing cerebral abscesses and the permanent damage to the structures in the brain can lead to death and prolonged hospital stay uh, may need higher level of care in a ward later i see and increase the cost to patient hospital and community because of all these reasons we talk about healthcare associated infection prevention so many of the healthcare associated infections are surgical site infections as i said cauti that it associated urinary tract infection you may have come across already uh, while working as medical students and catheter related blood stream infections crbsi central line associated blood stream infection clebsi and ventilator associated uh, pneumonia and many more so what are the risk factors for healthcare associated infections 
So inappropriate use of invasive devices or prolonged use can lead to an irrational use of antibiotics. I repeat, the irrational, not for indications. Uh, Dr. Nadisha pointed out the rational use of antibiotics also. So irrational use leads to uh, is a risk factor for healthcare associated. Superbugs come and sit. High risk, so other risk factors, high risk and sophisticated procedures are being done. They are needed for proper healthcare, but can be do uh, healthcare associated infections. And immunosuppression. There are quite a number of immunosuppressed patients due to different reasons, the disease itself and the medications, and uh, uh, those can lead to immunosuppression and chemotherapies and other drugs, steroids, and other severe underlying patient condition. And uncontrolled diabetes is a very common risk factor we come across for bacterial, fungal, all types of infection. Insufficient application of standard and isolation precautions. So there are standards. So we have to follow standard precautions and isolation precautions and transmission-based precautions. The insufficient application lead to many of the healthcare-associated infection. And inadequate environment hygienic condition and improper waste disposal also leads to they are at high risk of development. Healthcare-associated infection may be transmitted from healthcare worker to patient, from patient to patient, and from patient to healthcare worker. So how do the infections happen? Contact, droplet, and airborne. Out of them, the most, uh, I can't say the most important, is these are the three routes, but it can be uh, all of them, but the commonest we see by most commonly by the healthcare workers. I hope that you can hear me. Can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, madam, can hear you. Okay. So, the, our healthcare workers' hands play a major role for the contact transmission. So, we have to keep in mind, clean our hands. So, transmission by direct contact to our hands. And the next, the commonest time, I have to say, so clean hands, save lives. Clean hands, save lives. So it is, we have to keep in mind, the yesterday was the hand washing day. Universally, sad because day. So clean hands, very important. And spread of respiratory infections happen, either through droplet infections or airborne. The commonest, you know, droplet infections happen. And airborne pulmonary tuberculosis. And flu through droplets. You are very familiar with this uh, COVID-19. So droplet infections. Airborne can happen. Pulmonary tuberculosis in bronchoscopy rooms. We due to aerosolization. So we need to take extra precautions for airborne uh, precautions have to be taken. So this is how it happens. So indirect spread, these droplets can fall on the tables, um, it can be beds, wherever the patient is, falls on the doorknobs, the common thing, uh, on the tables and the beds, horizontal surfaces. And finally, we touch them, our hands. And without washing hands, or hand hygiene using alcohol-based hand rub, depending on the, uh, the, there are five moments. But the moment we have to do either washing or using the hand rub. So both are called hand hygiene. So if without hand hygiene, we touch the patients, uh, it will cause, can lead to healthcare associated infection. So these are indirect routes of transmission. Very important thing 
uh, stethoscopes, bed rails, hospital environment, we touch the environment and then without washing or hand hygiene, we touch the patient. This is a common route of transmission. And doctors' white coats also, they have to be very, very clean. And these club suits, I must say, so they are have to be used while working in the unit. When you leave the place, you have to uh, be back in your normal clothes and go out of the place. Because with the, those club suits, if you are going in the buses, to the keels, food cities, and walking along the roads and other places, it will lead to transmission. Nurses' uniforms, hospital garments, stethoscopes, thermometers, bed rails, patient care devices, trolleys, tables, they can be indirect route of transmission. So how to cough is also important. Now we don't use our precious hands to cover the mouth. So this is the way. So we uh, cough to the elbow. So the hands are precious. So this is the chain of infection. The infection agents, there is a susceptible host. And there is a portal of entry and means of transmission we discussed. And the portal of exit, there can be a reservoir. So as I mentioned, different, different places. And we touch and the infectious agent, this is a vicious cycle. So what we do is the in the infection control is break the chain of infection. So portal of entry, the transmission, we stop. So that is what we do, uh, breaking the chain of infection. There is another book you have to refer to, Hospital Infection Prevention and Control Manual by the College of Microbiologists. So you have to, this is the web, you can download. And all the med uh, medical faculties given, I think you are aware about this book. Please refer to this book for uh, it has many chapters related to, so we cannot cover within uh, this 45 minutes. And you make it a habit to refer to this book whenever you get uh, and whenever necessary to contact us. There are guidelines from WHO as well. They are also, you can download them for components of IPC programs at national and acute care facility, very important resources. And there are things called minimum requirements for the infection prevention and control. There is a separate book. They are very, very valuable documents for you to refer to. Then the backbone is the standard precautions in healthcare. So they are a set of, they are a set of very simple standardized practical guidelines followed to help to reduce the transmission of healthcare associated infections in hospital healthcare from all types of pathogens, from recognized and unrecognized infections. The important things are these have to be practiced by all healthcare workers in all patients. So standard precautions have to be practiced in all patients when attending to uh, all patients when you are attending to or when attending to patients regardless of their diagnostic or presumed infectious status. So standard precautions for all patients but transmission-based precautions like droplet precautions, airborne precautions are when the patient is confirmed or suspected to be uh, uh, to be a source of uh, infections transmitted by either droplets or airborne. Okay, so standard precautions components are. Uh, the main very important thing is hand hygiene, followed by personal protective equipment and self-injection practices. So we have to follow and proper disinfection, uh, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization. And then the handling waste properly, proper disposal and respiratory hygiene and 
pay uh, even appropriate personal health practices. So we have to do uh, to what fluids these standard precautions apply other than sweat, everything. Blood and body fluids, secretions, excretions, non-intact skin, when the skin is not intact, uh, the agents can come in, enter the body and mucous membrane. So how are these activities are organized in a hospital? When you start working in a hospital, you need to know how it operates. It's important. So infection, there are two bodies. Infection control committee take the policy decisions. It is a forum for multidisciplinary input. So they are selected from different disciplines, the representatives, and input and cooperation and inform share information share. It's a bigger body compared to the team. So it's a policy decision making body, wide representation from relevant departments. An infection control team takes the day to day activities. They are in the committee as well. But to make the things easier, so there is a separate team also to coordinate. But they doesn't mean these are the people who should do infection prevention and control. Infection prevention and control is everybody's responsibility. But to give the technical advice, we are there. Consultant microbiology serves as a technical head of the infection control unit. And there are medical officers and infection control nursing officers. So this team deals with day-to-day -day activities and members, they are members of the control committee as well. And all technical aspects of the infection prevention and control must be communicated to the consultant microbiologists of the hospital uh, to have give adequate advice. So these are some of the uh, graphic representations of standard precautions. Uh, important. So our hands are like this, unwashed hands. So a lot of bugs. That is why we practice hand hygiene. So this is the Ignis, Dr. Ignis Philip Semmelweis, who is a Hungarian physician. We regard him as great respect to him because he is considered the father of hand hygiene. Actually, he pointed out the importance of hand hygiene in 1874 in Vienna. Uh, demonstrated duties maternal mortality when healthcare workers wash their hands with soap and water because medical students frequently go into the autopsy room. So some of the wards uh, cared by the medical student, the other side, the doctors and nurses, but the medical student side, more infections. Ultimately, got to know that uh, we, uh, medical students frequent to visit the auto rooms also without washing hands coming to the patients. So the, the, after introducing hand hygiene, all the rates came down and both sides the same. So it is important for the medical students also to know now you all are pre-interns. So it is important to know. So some people give reasons for not practicing hand hygiene. They say it's too long. No, it is not. And skin irritation, poorly located things at times, but we have to practice and to be seen. I just touch a bit, but hand doesn't know. The germs, germs don't know that you take a little bit, touch a little bit. I forgot, I thought I did. And I will do it next time. And finally, I didn't know that you were watching. But you are not doing hand hygiene because the microbiologist or infection control team watching. It is our prime responsibility as responsible professionals. So they should be short. No artificial needs. No cheap polish. So while working in clinical areas. At the, and jewelry. No wearing jewelry and uh, the wristwatches. 
So hand must be free. Remove wall. And there should be adequate hand washing sinks. Good quality hand rubs. Soap and running water. So the soap box have to be clean. And when you are interns, if it is not clean, you can tell them to clean. And uh, as a team, you can advise and give, tell the sister it's important. So in a very polite manner. And the hand towels, reusable or disposable, not for the whole day one. It is not good. So you have to have disposable or reusable ones uh, in your workplace. So you try to be a hand hygiene role model or a champion. But a role model would be better because role models teach others also and encourage others to do. And gloves, gloves, wearing gloves. Some people tend to wear gloves and do all work with one pair of gloves. It disseminates, it spreads the infection. So gloves should be used, should not be actually should not, I, I think it is wrong, should not, should not be used as an adjunct, to, not a so substitute for hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is to be used before and after all glove use. So it is important you wearing, before wearing gloves, you should wash hands. And after removing gloves also, you should wash hands and glove, is not a substitute for hand hygiene. If you work with gloves, with one pair of gloves touching everywhere, with all patients, it will disseminate it, uh, can disseminate the infection. So gloves need to be changed and alcohol-based hand rub use after each patient procedure and going from dirty to clean sites, even on the same patient. So disposable gloves are to be used once only and not disinfected or washed. And hand rubs are not, should not be used on gloves. So some have a habit, it should not be done. They, it is not a um, rec recommended method. So when to perform hand hygiene at right times, that is WHO, five moments for hand hygiene. So WHO five moments for hand hygiene, it's clear in this, I think, before touching the patient, before clean or septic procedure, and three afters, after body fluid exposure risk, after touching the patient and after touching the patient surrounding. So all these five moments have to be done in the patient area. So in a big healthcare area, there are different patient areas. In each and every patient area, you have to do, uh, do these five moments for hand hygiene. Third moment is the most critical one. Third moment, that is after body fluid exposure is, you have to wash hands, it's open. No hand grab. And second moment, before clean, no aseptic procedure. Before aseptic procedure, we encourage people to wash hands, not hand rub. On, in all others, you can use hand rubs. So that these patients area is the point of care. So there we do hand hygiene. So the other thing is these uh, patients who on, these gadgets should not be taken. These are handphones and tabs, computers, have many germs, 25,000 germs in a square meter. A square, this is per square inch. This is 25 germs in per square inch. So in hospitals, they are mainly multi-drug resistant. So this is not off my head. They say it is mobile phone is dirtier than you think. Toilet seats are cleaner. So the most dangerous thing is when we are working in hospitals, uh, most of the bugs on handphones 
are multi drug resistant so we need to clean them with alcohol uh, before leaving the hospital very important or leaving the unit to another unit otherwise you take these bugs to other units as well so how to perform the technique i am not going to tell so proper technique who documents are there why the technique is important there can be missed areas so black in red and in orange some of the means area so that is why this technique has been designed by the wh so proper use of personal protective equipment so this is based on the risk risk the risk of the procedure so it is important for you to assess the risk and we are the necessary personal protective equipment unnecessary use of personal protective equipment lead to spreading of infection so ppe personal protective equipment depends on the procedure you plan to perform and type of transmission based precautions the patient is on for instance airborne precautions i said uh, diseases transmitted by yeah pulmonary tuberculosis you wear n95 masks and for droplet precautions general splash proof surgical or medical masks so it is important they are born precautions in 95 mask you wear uh, after doing the procedure you come out of the uh, room close the door and remove it those are important things about donning donning sequence is this one i am not going to read all these and doffing sequence i think you have been taught during your medical uh, career so doffing there are very good videos there's no time for me to uh, do that so it is important for you to go through those donning and doffing videos uh, how to do it and the other important i would suggest it for you to go through it's a very a very good video how to wear sterile gloves very important please go through 2023 video uh kindly i request you all to go through that video so if there is any contamination in between removing pp uh, perform hand hygiene uh, uh and then continue remove about sharps it is a frequent uh, observation that when the new batch of house officers come the needle stick injuries uh, increase injuries increase in number so it is important for you to follow the procedure should be minimized our idea is to minimize uh, the risk of getting infected because hepatitis b c and hiv are blood borne infections which can be transmit can get transmitted uh, by hand needle sting in the highest risk with hepatitis b and then c and lowest is hiv i hope that you all have your Uh, hepatitis b vaccination and must have check your antibodies as well uh, so avoid using sharps whenever possible only for indication like antibiotics only for indication so uh, generally both sharp uh, needle and syringe should go to the sharp bin both needle and syringe together should go to the sharp bin Uh, so take care to prevent injuries when using handling after procedure because they should not be kept on the kidney tray or the table or the bed etiquette or whatever it should by the producer directly go to the sharp bit because whenever you do the procedure involving sharps there should be a sharp bin close by so it is very important for you to follow if not then recapping should not be done if you need to do, in extreme cases if you want to do you have to use the scoop method keep the cap down and then do. i don't think that it is there is a necessity to do so user has to discard sharp directly into the sharp bin some of the sharp bins uh, uh, photo is there 
and do not remove used needles from disposable syringe by hand but i think for some hematological investigations you have, will have to do that but the sharp uh, needle and syringe both should go to the sharp bin uh, when three fourths full it has to be sealed uh, must be uh, sealed the sharp bin if you have seen such thing not happening you can tell them politely to do so and sharp must not be passed directly from hand to hand so there are better options safety needles and syringes which are actually not in the common use and they are not very much available uh, so but they are available um, worldwide so we have requested actually but i don't think with this economic crisis and other thing is uh, prevention uh, infection due to devices and procedures we try and uh, minimize by practicing clinical guidelines so that book i said hospital infection prevention control manual there are uh, quite uh, there is a chapter related to this so it is important for you to go through this clinical guideline before practicing so it is important uh to go through that uh so by practicing all these can make the hospital environment and equipment safe and cleaning disinfection and sterilization of instrument and proper waste disposal also are other important aspects uh, in the standard precaution so cleaning is the first step without cleaning no point in sterilizing so some people think so some of the administrators actually told oka kohoma sterilize karanawa ne ithin kamak ne but it is not so cleaning is the first step it is physical removal of dirt which removes many microorganisms when there is bio burden no point in disinfecting or sterilize so we the things we use on a patient so we they must be carried out before disinfection sterilization to make the process effective so cleaning process is difficult to quantify uh, other than visual so we physical removal of dirt in disinfection and antiseptic so disinfection is we do by equipment reusable ones But some of them those cannot be auto clean so process of elimination Uh, of nearly all recognized pathogenic organism pathogens this is causing ones but not necessarily all microorganisms from non living surfaces it is not from human body but surfaces like equipment or surfaces it is a relative process so we mainly using chemicals named disinfectants so we have to use the correct disinfection direct correct disinfectant correct concentration correct contact time correct procedure so antisepsis is when it is done on human body leaving surfaces skin mucous membranes those chemicals are called antiseptics alcohol is an antiseptic pcl tropical chloride of lime is and a uh, disinfectant so povidonidine is an antiseptic so likewise those are on body the human body is an antiseptic so sterilization is process by which complete elimination of all micro microbial forms including soap spores It is an absolute process and a complete process so we do this have the, we have to select whether we do the disinfect cleaning is done before both but we have to select whether it is disinfection or sterilization depends on the risk involved if somebody goes into the sterile site equipment it has to be sterilized so we there is a good chart in that book you have to go to the risk with the risk what to do low the disinfection can be low risk uh, low level disinfection high level disinfection 
So high level registry inspection we do for endoscopes. So uh, we do for some of the devices we use, reusable ones, we do high level disinfection. So you better to, for you to refer to the chart to see what has to be done. So guidelines are available. So you know that there is something called biofilm. So these bugs get gets attached to the surfaces of equipment. If we do not brush and clean, these biofilms are very happy. The organisms are very happy that without cleaning, the biofilm is still there. So disinfectant is not going to work. Whether it is sterilized, it is maybe there. And the antibiotics also cannot reach the target place. So it is important. I told the correct disinfectant, concentration, contact time, and procedure. You need to read the pack insert properly before use all disinfectants and antiseptics and follow manufacturer's instructions in preparing them. And they have to be used with proper PP on. So it is very important for you to follow that. And I said that infection risk is there with needle stick. The highest risk with hepatitis B uh, and then hepatitis C and least risk with with HIV, but people are scared for HIV, but I hope that you all have been vaccinated and no antibody levels. So if accidentally needle stick happens, immediate care has to be given. Allow the wound to bleed spontaneously. We are not going to squeeze. Wound should not be sucked or squeezed, should not be, and to encourage bleeding. Wash wound and skin with soap and water. Flush if mucus membrane splashed. Yesterday also such incident happened here. So flush mucus membranes with water adequately. Irrigate ties with clean water. Report the incident. There is a national circular available in this regard. So it has to be reported. It is your responsibility. There is a report. An incident reporting register for specially for needle stick injuries and splash injuries. So it is important to re report the source. You are the victim and there is a source, patient. Source is unknown if such a thing happens from the needle from a um, sharp beam. So be very careful. Such incident should not happen. If you keep somewhere and not known the, the source is, if something gets a needle stick injury, very dangerous. So it is important to be uh, very alert about this, direct it to the sharp beam. And if accidental things happen, report on the needle, uh, report on the accident reporting register. First thing, they inform the in charge, quickly do first aid, report, call the infection control unit and come with the book, the victim. And there can be individual arrangements in the hospital for hours also. Uh, there may be arrangements. We have arrangements here. So it depends on the hospital you are going to work. So vaccination, hope you got have got all these three doses. 0, 1, 6 months, testing of hepatitis B surface antigen 6 to 8 weeks after the last dose, and protective theta is equal or more than 10 milli IU, MIU per ml, with a few exceptions, uh, the ongoing high risk of exposure for bloodborne viral infection for which 100 MIU per ml is preferable, and keeping the result in a safe place to have a look when uh, necessity arises. Sometimes they say, can't find, but it has to be kept secure. The next important things as you all are going to work in hospitals, as out of soon, waste disposal. So waste management, waste segregation is very important. Segregation at the point of care. So you have to segregate them at the point of care, that is ward or unit to the national color code, according to the national color code. 
So sorting out of waste at the disposal site by a cleaner or whoever or before transportation is not recommended. So it is your duty as a HO or a doctor to segregate them appropriately according to this color code. Sometimes these bags colors may not be, but there should be a system to indicate what is the color. So this is the correct color code. Infectious waste is uh, yellow and black for uh, normal waste and green if food waste or uh, biodegradable because we segregate uh, biodegradable waste as only food waste because we hand them over to, for as food for pigs and uh, clean clean uh, clean uh, paper to blue clean plastics for orange and clean glass to red and sharp bin with yellow and red stripe and there are additions also now uh, cytotoxic waste in some of the cytotoxic zyus uh, and pharmaceutical waste uh, and uh, some of the additions, but these are actually should be there in each and every board. Management spill, management of spills also important for you to know uh, because spills can happen on the floor. Uh, heavy, they should be instructed to wear heavy duty gloves and soak the spill with an absorbent material, wadding or whatever, and cover with freshly prepared 1% type of chloride. Because as it shows, doctors, you should know what to be done. And leave for 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and then remove. Uh, that is the way and uh, freshly prepared type of chloride. So there should be spill kits in the wards, containing the essentials in the box and it should be available and all should know where it is. Otherwise, when a spill happens, can't walk around in search of the spill kit. So it has to be in a place where everybody in the world knows, staff know. So I am not going to read about this. I explain it has to be freshly prepared 1% hydrochloride. So there should be powder, uh, available inside the spill kit. And reporting of accidents and uh, actually taking prompt action, I informed in the accident reporting register. And immunization against hepatitis B and chicken pox, those who are non-immune, at least if you can uh, check uh, IgG is better. And if we have not... Uh, you can ask the mother whether you want it or not. And if not, uh, better to be get better to get vaccinated uh, yourself. Okay. Uh, so management of needle stick injuries, wash wound uh, with soap and water, irrigate the mucous membranes, report all exposures to infection control team to the uh, sectional head immediately, maintain an accident reporting register. Fill it and report for the counseling. It is important when you get a needle stick injury, you actually, we need counseling and we have to explain really. So you have to come with that accident reporting register to the infection control unit uh, for the advice. And adherence to clinical guidelines uh, is important. Bundle approach. There are web bundles. In this book, it says clamsy bundles are there. Uh, so web bundles. So their bundle approach is important. So I'm not going to explain about all these bundles. So what I need is the care bundle is a collection of intervention. When practice three, or, three to five are there. So all, uh, when we are practice them together, the outcome would be better. A care bundle is a, me, uh, is a means to ensure that the application of all the interventions is consistent for all patients at all times, thereby improving outcomes. So there can be CVC, central venous bundles, 
ventilator bundles and urine catheter care bundles. So it is important for you to know uh, the, about this bundle. It's below the bladder levels, it is abdomen of the patient when transporting. So those are some of the important points. And there are notifiable diseases list. So timely notification of infectious disease is important. Uh, you have to know about notifiable disease list and special word about tuberculosis and increasing numbers of pulmonary as well as extra pulmonary. Uh, so it is important for you to uh, report all these, not only pulmonary tuberculosis, so notifiable diseases. So when suspected things are included, the encephalitis, meningitis, everything. Uh, and cough areas are there in some of the hospitals to collect samples and then identify masks when uh, aerosol generating ones in 95 walk in 95 masks. They are called respirators. For droplet precautions, you have to wear the, the mask you wear is medical or surgical masks. And not only wearing, the disposal has to be done correctly. Donning and doffing, both are important. Without contamination to uh, the environment. So they have to be discarded into the infectious waste bin. So those are some of the important points I have to highlight. Uh, so I think uh, I have come to the end. I think uh, if there are questions, uh, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, if there are questions. Of... All understood? If not, we can. So, in the absence of uh, questions, then shall we start? Okay, madam. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, madam. That was Dr. Geetika Patmanike, consultant microbiologist and the former president of College of uh, Microbiology. Thank you, madam, for that comprehensive lecture. So we thank the college uh, president and the College of Microbiologists for organizing this session for the newly uh, for the new pre-interns. So thank you once again. Thank you, madam. Actually, I encountered one small mistake in the presentation. If you need yes, the presentation, madam. I can correct it and resend to you. Okay, madam. We'll catch you later. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, tomorrow we have uh, emergency medicine session. So uh, join by once again, I'll tell you the time. Excuse me, are you guys there? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Vaidhi has uh, shared the link for the feedback form. Can you all please uh, uh, fill in that feedback? There's a link for the feedback, uh, the Google thank form. You, thank, you. thank you for that. Um, how about the attendance, please? Are, are we... Marking the attendance for today.
uh, tomorrow 9 a.m. we are starting the emergency medicine uh, uh, session. So join by 8.45. So certificate, uh, we will share a link now. So... So I will share the format of the uh, is the uh, link so make sure that you all enter your email address properly here. So in case you all don't correctly write your email address, for example, any capitals, then you won't get the certificate. So make sure before you go to the next the next one, before you go to the next page, correctly type the email address. So last time also we encountered a lot of people are not receiving the uh, certificate because they are not entered the email address properly. So if you all enter the email address wrong, you won't get the certificate. Right? Make sure before you go to the next step, check above 10 times and write, submit to go to the next level. So tomorrow we are having emergency medicine. So if you all can submit, answer the questions, then you all can go ahead and uh, completed the whole uh, MCQ session that include all the employee microbiology, emergency medicine, internal medicine, everything. So you can go to and collect it. So if you all do think that is difficult for you all without the lecture, so you can <clears throat> follow the lectures tomorrow and complete it. Uh, so the, another thing is, uh, will be the uh, once you complete it, it will be delivered in batches. So so all might not get at one time it will get in batches so that's the point so i will share the link on the chat box now any questions will we get the link today for the um that you, that you mentioned today that you're going to send us the link will you be getting that today right now or how Yeah, hold your guns. We are sending it now. So the email, uh, the, the Gmail or Yahoo is not, it's not a problem, right? Gmail. Uh, uh -huh. Any, uh -huh. any, any account is not a problem, right? 